At this moment it seemed to everyone that the German ships were hiding just over the horizon and could appear at any second. Therefore, the safety of any ship depended directly on the speed it would be able to develop. Some of the escort ships decided to move on together. Among them was the Corvette Poppy, which kept on the right flank of the convoy. He snuck between the diverging transports and found a new friend, Corvette Lotus, which was on the left flank of the convoy. But even before the commanders could agree on joint action, the Poserix air defence ship asked to cover him. The Poserix had a primitive ASDIC, and apparently the commander feared the nearby submarines. As a result, the Corvette Poppy, Lotus and La Malouine joined the Poserica. On the latter, in addition to the flag of St. George, was raised the French flag, but the crew remained British. All these ships headed northeast towards the ice barrier. Sailors at the same time with undisguised anxiety looked at the southwestern horizon. Herring followed this group and saw it meet the rescue vessel Ratlin, which was carrying more than 60 rescued men. The small vessel had a top speed of only 12 knots, so it cost a lot of labor to keep up with the group. Its chimney was billowing thick black smoke, and the stokers had to work continuously with shovels. The trawler Halcyon also turned north to the ice, while the other two trawlers, Salamander and Britomart Me, went southeast with Palomars and the last corvette Dianella. That left only us, four trawlers, the slowest of the guard ships. We were the ones with the smallest chance of escape. The River Afton and the trawler Ayrshire beeped our captain, asking if he was going to join them. But as the ships of the escort were ordered to proceed on their own, our commander declined the offer. So the Ayrshire went north alone. Our commander wanted to do the same, but then the captain of the Lord Middleton, who was the senior of the trawler commanders, took command of the remaining three trawlers. So we, together with the Middleton and Nuffengem, formed up in a keel Vata column and went at maximum speed to the northeast to get close to the ice edge as quickly as possible. At some distance from us could be seen merchant ships, which had not yet had time to separate, though most of them were gone. Some of them, too, were heading north toward the ice edge to ensure their safety from submarine attacks from at least one side. Others were rushing straight eastward. It should be added that many ships were now beginning to have trouble determining their course. Until now, the convoy had been led by warships equipped with gyrocompasses. Many merchant ships had only magnetic compasses, which at high latitudes lied far more often than they told the truth. The farther north a ship gets, the greater the deviation of the magnetic compass from the true meridian, so in the Arctic setting a course by magnetic compass is a hopeless task. So the day of July 4 ended unbelievably. Trawlers were busting their boilers to get away quickly, and merchant ships, which we had to protect, were forced to continue sailing on their own. There was a relatively brief period of calm for them. The enemy was confused at first, but soon the triumphant Germans discovered what had happened, whereupon submarines and airplanes began the hunt. The long tragic day of July 5, Black Sunday, began. The first victim was found by one of the German submarines. The most offensive was that she was an American vessel making a second attempt to reach Russia. The transport Carlton was included in the PQ-16 convoy, four days after leaving Iceland. The convoy was attacked by dive bombers, and the transport sustained damage from a close burst before being towed back to Hevelfjord by a trawler. Now, at the very beginning of Sunday morning, some seven hours after the disbanding of the convoy, the crew was sailing at twelve knots under the unreliable cover of a faint haze. Its skipper decided to lie on an Oso course, straight into the White Sea. Five observers of the Carlton did not notice that the submarine was sneaking up on the transport. 
At 5.10, a torpedo hit the starboard side of the ship near the midships. It exploded in one of the cargo tanks containing 5,000 gallons of fuel. It immediately burst into flames and the fire began to spread rapidly through the ship. A column of flame flew out of the engine room. A column of water mixed with oil grew near the starboard side. It collapsed on the superstructures. Two starboard dinghies were thrown to the cargo deck. The hatch covers were blown off and flour from the holds flew onto the deck. The bulkheads of the cabins in the middle part of the ship collapsed. The gun bank on the ute was crumpled. The engine room killed two sailors and was immediately flooded. Although no one was operating the machinery, the propeller spun for another seven minutes until the stoker room was flooded. Power was lost and the emergency transmitter was broken. The ship's gunners, unable to see the attacker, hurriedly abandoned ship with other sailors after the captain's orders were received. The captain did not pull, seeing that the ship was sinking fast. In addition, he feared that 200 tons of Trinitratoluene might explode. Sailors repelled down ropes, or simply jumped into the water. They swam to four life rafts and one lifeboat. Altogether, they had 32 sailors and 11 gunnery crewmen on board. Carlton was quickly landing on an even keel and sank within 12 minutes. The submarine surfaced to follow his last moments, but made no attempt to contact the survivors. Half an hour later, she departed, leaving them alone in the icy waters of the Barents Sea. The British transport empire Byron, which was just north of the Carlton, also received a torpedo in the middle part of her hull about an hour after she was lost. The ship's carpenter, Frederick Cooper, ran out onto the deck and saw that it was covered with debris. The trucks the ship was carrying had simply disappeared. They had been thrown overboard by the explosion. The ship, which was barely making eleven knots, was hit in hold no. Three under the gunner's mess. One of them had just brought a cup of hot cocoa to his comrades, who were on duty at the gun, and was about to go down to the cockpit for a new one when an explosion went off right under his feet. The gunner was killed. The explosion blew off two large airplane containers, which slid to starboard and crushed the six gunners. Captain John Horton almost immediately gave the order to abandon ship. Frederick Cooper ran aft to lower the two surviving life rafts. As this was done, he heard shouts calling for help from No. 3 Hatch. The gangway had been blown down, so Cooper lowered a line into the hold and slid down it. Tanks and trucks that had been ripped off their mountings were rushing around the hold, and a four-foot-thick layer of water was splashing on the deck, with corpses floating in it. Cooper managed to drag four of the stunned, half-drowned men to the hatch, climbed out and pulled the others down with him. Cooper climbed down a fifth time and tried to free the trapped gunners. At this time, the other sailors tried to pry open the hatch, but were unsuccessful. Cooper grabbed the arm of a sailor who had his legs crushed. The terrified man pleaded with him, for God's sake, don't leave me here. You'd better chop off these damned legs. But the water was rising fast and the artilleryman was choking right in front of Cooper's eyes. He could do nothing and climbed out of the hold by a halyard. Tears were streaming down his face. Cooper hastily put life jackets on the four sailors he had pulled out of the hold and pushed them into the water to be picked up by the lifeboats. He then discovered that he was alone on the vessel. Cooper jumped into the water and swam to the lifeboat. It was half a mile away, but he managed to swim to it. Along with the Empire Byron, ten people drowned. The transport disappeared underwater after twenty minutes. It sank stern first with the flag flying. In addition to those who died in the explosion and drowned, one other man died. He was already sitting in the dinghy but suddenly announced that he had forgotten his bank book and ran to get it. He was never seen again. Another stoker was also missing. 
dead tired after his watch. He had fallen into a deep sleep and was simply forgotten. Two lifeboats were safely away from the ship, although one of the life rafts was crushed against the side of the transport. Frederick Cooper picked up several sailors from the water in his skiff. The submarine surfaced and passed around the mass of floating wreckage. She then approached the lifeboats and handed the British a third mechanic, who was pulled out of the water by the submariners. The submarine commander asked what the name of the vessel was, what cargo it was carrying and where it was going, and who the captain was. But the sailors replied that they had last seen the captain on the bridge. In reality, Wharton was in one of the dinghies, but hid his uniform jacket under a can. The Germans then took aboard an army captain who was on his way to Russia as an instructor. He was supposed to teach the Russians how to handle the tanks the Empire Byron was carrying, but instead was captured. The Germans then photographed the site of the sinking of the transport several times. The boat commander handed the British some sausages, black bread, brandy and pointed out a course to the nearest shore. He expressed regret that he was forced to sink the ship and wished the sailors a safe end of the trip. The submariners saluted, the boat moved farther away and sank. After that, another wave of German planes appeared on the southern horizon. Its first victim was the Peterkerr, which was heading directly south. The skipper of the transport, W.E. Butler, decided to go straight into the White Sea, and as a result was much further south than the other transports. That is why Peter Keir was the first to be hit by enemy aircraft. On Sunday morning, three Ju-88 bombers appeared and attacked the transport. Peter Kerr started shooting back, and although all the sailors saw the tracer bullets hitting the lead plane, it didn't stop the Germans. After several close bursts, three bombs dropped by one of the planes exploded on the hatch between the bridge and engine room. The explosions shook the transport, on which fires immediately broke out. The fire lines were severed, so the sailors could not put out the fires. Captain Butler gave the order to abandon ship, and two lifeboats were lowered onto the mirror-smooth sea. Thank God I had my wooden leg with me, exclaimed senior mechanic Herbert Richard as he descended into the lifeboat. He wore a wooden prosthesis and always kept a spare in his cabin, but this one was his favourite. The attacking plane circled over the lifeboats. One passed at very low altitude, shooting sparks from the engine. One of the stokers thought they were being strafed and jumped out of the dinghy, but the pilots simply photographed the results of their attack and flew away, shaking their wings as triumph. None of the 36 sailors of the Peter Kerr and 12 men of the gunnery crew received a scratch. They had seen two ships attacked by airplanes to the north and decided that it would be extreme folly to return to their ship, which was blazing like a bonfire. Now it was the turn of the submarines again. A few miles to the north, the transport Honomu was doing its best to maintain a speed of 11 knots, but its ten observers failed to spot the boat that attacked the transport. A torpedo hit the starboard side. The explosion destroyed the stoker, the ship lost power, and the radio was out of order. The ship began to sink rapidly, but no one still saw the slightest sign of the submarine. About forty crew members left the sinking transport without panic, but another nineteen were missing. They were probably killed by the explosion of the first torpedo, or the second, which had already hit the left side of the Anoma. The ship began to sink stern forward and in ten minutes disappeared underwater. Shortly afterward, two submarines rose to the surface near the floating wreckage, and a third submarine appeared a quarter mile away. One of the boats approached the dinghies and its commander ordered the captain of the Anoma to come aboard. Then the Germans asked if the dinghies had enough fresh water and handed the rescuers some canned meat and bread. 
The submariners smugly promised that in a couple of days the Americans would be picked up by German destroyers. Then all three boats headed east. It was to the east of the Anomu at this time that the Fairfield City and Daniel Morgan were under fierce attack by dive bombers and other aircraft. Fairly quickly the Ju-88 stopped the Fairfield City, which took two direct hits and several close bursts. The crew abandoned ship and began hastily rowing away as the transport landed deeper and deeper in the water. Three miles away was the Daniel Morgan, which persistently repelled one attack after another for more than two hours. Its captain set a course for the islands of Novaya Zemlya, located on the other side of the Barents Sea. The transport managed to reach a speed of 13 knots and zigzagged to meet the attacking planes with fire from the entire side, not just the bow or stern gun. All German planes in the vicinity pounced on it, but the transport's guns fired frantically and two Ju-88s were forced to land on the water nearby. The third dive bomber went south, dragging a huge tail of black smoke behind it. The dive bombers dropped a total of about 80 bombs, of which 30 exploded in close proximity to the ship. But then three bombs did hit the transport, which suffered heavy damage as a result. Two holes were flooded, and the speed dropped rapidly. At this point, a torpedo hit the starboard side of the Daniel Morgan, disabling the machinery and steering. The transport 76M guns overheated and jammed. The ammunition was almost used up. The end was near. Strangely enough, only one man died in this fierce battle. That sailor was killed by a bomb blast. But when the order was given to abandon ship, two more sailors drowned while boarding the lifeboats. The Daniel Morgan sank stern first. Soon a submarine appeared on the surface and approached the lifeboats. The Germans demanded to know the ship's name, tonnage and cargo. Then one of them photographed the lifeboats and ordered them to follow the boat. This was complied with. The strange procession travelled southward for an hour and a half, but then the boat gave full speed and sped away. The surviving sailors imagined with horror what a long way they would have to travel to reach the nearest land, as suddenly an unexpected saviour appeared on the horizon, the tanker Donbass. Although dead tired, the gunners of the Daniel Morgan volunteered to maintain the Russian ship's bow gun, and soon afterwards shot down a dive-bombing Ju-88 with a direct hit, driving the other two planes away. But all through that long day, the extermination of the almost defenceless transports continued. Four ships were heading east, keeping within sight of each other, Oldersdale, Zafaran, Ocean Freedom and Salamander. The tanker had been followed by a lone bomber for several hours now, circling in the clear sky. The sailors were glad to get some cover when rare tearing clouds appeared. At the same time, the tanker managed to get a little closer to the minesweeper Salamander and the transport Ocean Freedom. Most of the crew of the Aldersdale perceived what was happening with grim fatalism. What is to come is what is to go. The sailors realized only one thing. They were terribly tired. It seemed unbelievable that any of the transports managed to escape, and the decision of the commander of the Aldersdale Hobson to go to the shores of Novaya Zemlya was perceived as purely formal. Nevertheless, the tanker's gunners prepared to sell their lives dearly. Zafarin, which was full of sailors from transports sunk the day before by torpedo carriers, tried to develop maximum speed when the message came that the German ship's only 30 miles away. Owen Morris, the commander of the Zamalek, suggested to the captain of the Zafarin Magon that they should follow together. But there was always rivalry between the rescue ships. Especially the captains did not get along, and Bagon refused. The Zafaran's speed was half a knot faster than the Zamalik's, so it pulled ahead. 
but at the same time the Zafaran's crew were cursing the Zamalek at every turn, because it was smoking desperately. Since there was no wind at all, the column of smoke rising vertically served as an excellent beacon for the Germans. In addition, on the radio came the constant threats of Lord Howe Howe to the sailors, so the Zafaran raced ahead. But the ship's carpenter, James Ramsay, still took out a bottle of whiskey from a hiding place in the double bottom. Being a true Scotchman, he could not afford to lose such a precious cargo in case the ship was lost. He and a few of the gunners therefore spent the morning hours, together with some of the gunners, quite cheerfully. But the notional polar morning changed to an equally notional afternoon, and German planes appeared and attacked the four ships. Three Ju 88s dropped bombs on the Aldersdale. One of the bombers was lucky. Thomas Irwin, firing from an Alicon, saw the grey testicles form close to the port side. They exploded just under the stern of the tanker, and its machinery was immediately disabled. The stern bridge was mangled. The pump room flooded, steam from the engine room fell into the sky, and an oil slick began to spread around the tanker. One of the junior mechanics, responding to an inquiry from the bridge as to whether anyone was injured, snapped. What the hell is the colour of the blood? The tanker had lost steam, but there were other ships nearby that could provide assistance, so Hobson, commander of the Aldersdale, decided to abandon ship. One of third mate Henry Phillips' duties was to destroy secret papers. Going up to the navigator's cabin, he found the navigator, Charlie Cairns, almost crying. The deckhouse was a mess. New charts, coloured ink, glue rulers, and other navigational paraphernalia were piled on the deck. Cairns bemoaned the wasted effort. When Phillips later arrived on the dinghy deck, he found that both dinghies had departed, leaving six men on the tanker, with each dinghy certain that the men had been taken by the other. The captain, chief mate, chief mechanic Phillips, and two other men remained on the ship. Running aft, they lowered the skiff. Soon the salamander picked up the entire crew of the tanker. Before leaving the ship, Erwin and his comrades shot all the ammunition of the Ehrlichons so that their barrels were red hot. On board the salamander, Hobson and Lieutenant Mottram, commander of the minesweeper, discussed the situation and decided to try to take the tanker in tow. But just as preparations began to wind up the towing end, the salamander was ordered to give full throttle. Hobson was given five minutes to decide whether to return to the tanker or stay on the minesweeper. He was extremely reluctant to stay, so Mottram decided to try to sink the older stale with artillery fire. The result was completely unexpected. The first 100 tomb shell blew the winch and a coil of cable off the salamander's tank. When the order was given to increase the gun's elevation angle, the lock fell out of the gun. So the idea arose to set the tanker on fire by firing incendiary bullets into the pumping compartment to try to blow up the cargo of aviation gasoline. But the bullets just bounced off the hull. Fortunately, someone realised in time that the tanker could explode, taking with it to the bottom and the minesweeper. Finally, the order came to drop some depth bombs in front of the engine room. Exploded three or four bombs but the tanker refused to sink, although by this time its stern went deep into the water and the stem was in the air. The other ships in this group had so far successfully repelled the air attacks, but this did not last too long. Ocean Freedom and Zafaran split up, whereupon one particularly determined pilot dived on the Zafaran and aptly dropped three bombs. One of them either exploded just under the starboard side of the ship or punctured the hull below the water lean altogether. Either way, as the columns of water fell, the ship was rapidly setting stern to stern and the machinery started and began to waste steam. Busy, 
The carpenter had his left arm badly scalded by the explosion. He rushed to the boat deck, where several frightened passengers were trying to lower the yawl. The stubborn Captain McGeon threatened them and ordered them to stop panicking. However, the boat was still lowered, whereupon Ramsay, with the others, began to lower the heavier dinghies. None of them had even been touched before. The skiff hung on the ordinary swivel davits, but the heavier davits were lowered by means of the patented pop-up davits and stood on the keel blocks for the time being. After several attempts, Ramsay and his assistants found that the davits had sold through the deck and the davits could not be lowered. Ramsay rushed to the starboard davits and found them to be exactly the same. By this time, the Zephyron had already settled down considerably and Captain McGeown shouted to Ramsay to save himself. The carpenter rushed to the tank and threw the raft off the port side. A whole crowd immediately gathered on it. Ramsay ran to the starboard side and dropped another raft. Then he swam to the raft, which had capsized. It was designed for ten men, but at least twenty wanted to get on. Ramsay and the others clung to the side of the raft and swam away from the Zafarin which jerked violently and began to sink stern first. All this happened within four minutes. Quite unexpectedly, the sea was quite warm, as one of the branches of the Gulf Stream was passing through here. Ramsay and his companions swam to two rafts and climbed on them. By this time the fog had descended and no ships could be seen in the vicinity. The sailors began to feel uncomfortable. But after three hours of sailing, the salamander appeared in the distance. Then came the desperately fuming Zamalek. The ship they had recently cursed had brought them deliverance. It was rather strange to be aboard a ship that Lord Howe, Howe said, had only recently been sunk. Those present were counted head to head, and it was discovered that one of the gunners was missing. A small argument followed with the captain of the Zamalek. Magon was older and went to the bridge, intending to take command. Captain Morris, however, politely but firmly put him in his place. Although Morris was not distinguished by his rich boy build, he had the soul of a lion. Magon went downstairs and sat in his cabin for the rest of the voyage, brooding. Not only had he lost his own ship, but he had been rescued by his bitterest rival. Meanwhile, Captain Morris was already discussing tactics with his gunner, who occasionally thought he was in command of the ship. But Captain Morris had given him a rebuke as well. Ecre. A little farther north and nearer the ice barrier, the Earlston was sailing all alone. Early in the morning his crew had time to see the last minutes of the Empire Byron. After the convoy had disbanded, the Earlston had tightened the safety valves to raise the steam pressure in the boilers and brought her speed up to 14 knots. The mechanics pushed the machine to the limit. A few hours after the loss of the Empire Byron, the crew of the Earlston were sitting down to lunch when the bells of the loud battle rang out again. Five torpedo carriers showed up on the left bow. The old 102M gun opened fire from long range and already the second shell exploded right under the cockpit of one of the planes. The plane was tossed to the side, but it still dropped a torpedo that went straight at the ship. Starboard? And the ship began to turn, but it was agonizingly slow. Still, the Earlston dodged the torpedo, which passed only twenty feet off the side. The airplanes flew away. The damaged one dragged along behind, gradually losing altitude. But now two submarines were the gun opened fire on them, but almost immediately the firing stopped. As the boats approached, the lifeboats then on the starboard traverse appeared eight Ju-88 dive bombers, one of which immediately went to attack. Coming in, right out of the sun, shouted a sailor from the upper bridge. For a few seconds it was still quiet, and then began firing literally from all the barrels available on the ship. The airplane was descending lower and lower, 
Would it never come out of the dive? The sailors saw the bomb hatch flaps open and bombs fell out. They leisurely turned over and rushed downward. One bomb fell from the starboard side, the other from the port side. Huge columns of water rose. But the ship was not damaged. But the junkers did not come out of the dive. He collapsed into the sea on the left side. Then the second bomber went to attack, which did not dare to descend so low. It dropped its bombs ahead of the ship and hastily pulled away. The ship was still without a scratch. A third plane, two more bombs, and again no damage. And then the gunners of the Earlston stopped counting. They loaded the guns and fired as fast as they could, and the bombs rained down on the ship in a hail. But luck could not continue indefinitely. It was either a direct hit or a very close burst that literally lifted the Earlston out of the water. All the steam lines in the engine room burst. The pumps were torn from their beds, and the car was just moved nine inches to the side, and the engine room began to fill rapidly with water. There was nothing to be done, and it was pointless to stay aboard. The ship was a helpless target, and the only way to save lives was to leave the ship in lifeboats. At 3.10 p.m., Three hours and ten minutes after the alarm had been sounded, Skipper Stanwyck ordered the crew to abandon the Earlston. When gunner Richard Crossley left his gun, the first thing he decided to do was to get better dressed. Crossley ran downstairs and grabbed an army leather coat, pocketing the half pound of tobacco he decided to bring home to his father. Then he went back up on deck to help launch the dinghies. There were two of them, plus a skiff and a life raft. The skiff was a hole and immediately began to sink, but the entire crew got off the ship safely, although airplanes bombarded them as they boarded the lifeboats. In addition to the ship's crew and artillery crew, there were five passengers on board. A British Ministry of Supply employee bound for Russia, another civilian, and three Russian sailors from the sunken ship. The plane stubbornly circled over the lifeboats and made another approach to the ship, but dropped no more bombs. Then four submarines came to the surface, two two hundred yards away, one a mile away and another a mile farther. The three nearest boats formed a triangle around the dinghies. The commander of one of them ordered Skipper Stenwick to come aboard him. Stenwick asked to help his crew in any way, but the German refused. To the farewell shouts of the sailors, Stenwick disappeared down the hatch. When the sailors asked what course to follow to the nearest land, the submarine commander replied dryly, This is war. Get there on your own. Three torpedoes were fired at the helpless vessel. Two passed by, but the third hit the target but the Earlston stubbornly refused to sink. The boats submerged. The bombers were still not leaving. One of them flew over the lifeboats at low altitude, as if intending to bombard them. But instead it only shook its wings triumphantly and flew away. The lifeboats drew closer together, and the sailors tied them together with a cable. Now the planes resumed their attacks on the doomed transport flying literally at the height of the masts to drop their bombs. But the Germans could not get a direct hit. Finally, one of the bombers did hit the hold no. One where ammunition was stored. There was a huge blue flash, and the ship began a volcanic eruption. The entire bow was blown to pieces. The steamboat on deck flew into the air and crumbled. The surviving sailors saw the mangled hull of the ship lifted stern into the air, turned over and disappeared under the water. It happened at 30 p.m. East of the Earlston was the American ship Pancraft. This was a very old steamer, formerly plying the west coast. It too was travelling alone when seven Ju-88s rushed at it from the direction of the sun. Three planes attacked the transport and dropped nine bombs, staying out of artillery range. Six of the bombs fell pretty far away, but the last three lay more accurately. 
One hit directly into hold three, located between the bridge and the crew quarters. Fortunately, it fell on a large pile of coal sacks, which absorbed almost all the force of the explosion. The other two bombs exploded next to the ship, tearing apart its sides. Steam billowed from the breaches, water began to flood the engine room, and the machinery steeled. The broadcast system was damaged, and the captain was not even able to order the crew to abandon ship. Radium and J.A. Blackwell jumped out of the radio room and found that all the lifeboats had already pulled away from the ship and had managed to move 25 yards or more away. Only one dinghy was dangling, tethered by a halyard. He rushed back into the deck house, got the second operator, and they went down the storm trap into the water. Then they had to swim to the waiting dinghy along the halyard. The captain was already in one of the dinghies. To the fury of the crew, he and the chief mate were the first to escape. Some of the sailors believed that the damage could still be repaired and sailed on. Then they accused the captain and Exo of simply not being in command of the ship. The captain managed to take with him American secret documents, but in a terrible hurry left all the British papers. Came at the general panic. The second mate came to the fore. He took responsibility for the safe evacuation of the crew. Radium and Blackwell and his mate thought they were the last to leave the ship. But after their dinghy had travelled about a mile, they saw three other men on board. One of them went off into the water and the second ran to the tank and lowered a life raft. The third sailor, who was badly injured, went off the storm trap into the water and died a few minutes after being picked up by the lifeboat. Sailors also found the body of a second mate on deck. He was approximately sixty years old and had died of a heart attack as no wounds were found on his body. His tragic death further increased the crew's hatred for the captain. So the lifeboats were moving away, and the motionless transport stood waiting for the decision of its fate. German airplanes circled in the sky and apparently photographed what was happening. At he said, Ditcher, the commander of the transport Washington, was driving his old steamer at the maximum speed of ten knots. Dense ice forced him to take a much more southerly course than the captain would have liked. This put the ship noticeably closer to enemy planes. But, to Richter's relief, the Washington soon fell into a dense fog. Taking advantage of this unexpected cover, the steamer carried on, straining her machinery. However, the fog eventually cleared, and suddenly out of the low clouds jumped out of the dive bomber, rushing at the transport. Fortunately, its bombs exploded away. As the horizon cleared, other ships became visible. Richter approached the nearest two and signaled to follow together to work together to repel air attacks. The British transport Bolton Caster and the Dutch Paulus Potter readily agreed. Bolton Castle was lucky in that it had on board four Russian sailors rescued from ships of previous convoys. One of them turned out to be a navigator who knew the Arctic very well. He advised the British captain to go straight into the ice and move to the northern tip of Novaya Zemlya. There it would be possible to turn south along the eastern coast of the islands while in the Kara Sea. When the three ships started sailing together, Calls for help from the attacked ships began to come over the radio. But that help never arrived. In the afternoon, these ships were attacked by a bomber which immediately dropped bombs as soon as it came under combined fire. The Washington was shaken violently by the close bursts. A minute after this single plane attacked, the trio was attacked by either six or seven planes. They dropped bombs from low altitude and shelled the decks with machine guns. On board the Bolton Castle, everything was ready for the five o'clock tea. The tables were set, cold meats, salads, fruit, muffins and cakes. Senior cook Leonard Osmondson later recalled this meal with longing, 
when he spent several days in the deep. Most of the gunners were firing at the fucky wolves and herrings when out of nowhere a stuka appeared and spiked onto the ship from the port side, putting a bomb right into the ship. The upper part of the hull ahead of the bridge was splintered, and one gunner was thrown from the bridge directly into the sea by the shock wave. It seemed to the crew of the Washington that the British vessel simply disappeared. But, strangely enough, the ammunition in the hole did not detonate. Coke Osmanze ran to the nearest dinghy, which the sailors were already launching. Although the ship had been tilted to starboard, the sailors had managed to launch two dinghies and were now rowing as hard as they could to get as far away from the sinking ship as possible. By some miracle, no one was hurt. Even the artilleryman, who had been thrown into the water, was in a few minutes in one of the lifeboats. Although he was very cold, he survived. For 36 hours, tireless gunners Bolton Castle repulsed all the attacks of German aircraft, and now the wrecked transport sank in just five minutes. It suddenly jerked and began to sink rapidly stern forward, without lowering the flag of the British Merchant Navy flying on the mast. The airplane passed over the dinghies and fired a burst of machine gun fire at them, but hit no one. Then other planes descended, but the sailors quickly realized that they were merely photographing the scene of the ship's destruction. As the bombers flew away, one of the pilots waved his hand as if to indicate the direction in which to but that was the way to Norway and the POW camps, so the sailors decided to sail straight east. After gathering everything they could use from the water, they abandoned the third dinghy, dividing the supplies from it between the captain's motorboat and the sailing velboat. Then the motorboat took the dinghy in tow, and they moved on their way. No sooner had the Bolton caster sunk than the Paulus Potter was hit. The British artillery crew repelled the attacks of the planes until another series of bombs covered the ship. The fragments of the close bursts riddled the hull. From the concussion of the machines moved off the foundation, but there was also one direct hit. The bomb passed close to the banquet of the 102-room gun, ripped off the rudders and jammed the propeller. The captain ordered the ship abandoned, but gunner David Richard and his mates loaded the 102M guns and fired at the airplane flying Austin. The plane abruptly lost altitude and dropped its bombs into the sea. The four gunners then went down into the dinghy with the captain and second mate. The planes continued to bombard the Paulus Potter with machine guns, but paid no attention to the lifeboats. When they flew away, the motorboat took the rest of the boats in tow and dragged them away from the burning motionless ship. Then it was the Washington's turn. A new group of bombers appeared in the sky and vigorously attacked the transport, dropping bombs and shelling the deck with machine guns. The ship's small guns were firing continuously, but it did not help. A series of bombs landed close to the starboard side, shattering the plating. The ship immediately tilted, the trucks standing on the deck burst into flames, set on fire by incendiary bullets. Another bomb exploded under the stern, disabling the rudder. Captain Richer ordered the ship abandoned. The entire crew safely moved into two lifeboats, while the bombers fired machine guns at the transport. A massive fire raged on the ship, with flames shooting high into the sky. Since 500 tons of trinitrotoline in the hold could explode at any moment, the sailors rowed as hard as they could, trying to get away from the ship as quickly as possible. The bombers made a few circles over the dinghies, but only to take a few more pictures. The pilots waved goodbye and flew away, while the sailors dismantled their oars. They had about 360 miles to go to reach Novaya Zemlya. About an hour after that, the Olopana transport caught up with the lifeboats from the three vessels. The transport stopped to pick up the men. So far the Olopana had been lucky, although her skipper Stone had serious doubts about the voyage's successful outcome. 
Ritzer boarded the storm trap and was asked if his sailors would like to transfer to the Alpana. So he returned to the Dinghuai to canvass the men, and the answer was, though unexpected, perfectly firm. Richter shouted to Stone on the bridge, We will not go aboard as my sailors feel safer in the Dinghuis. Good luck. Follow on. Yes, the crews of the Bolton Castle and Paulus Potter chose to stay in the lifeboats to fight the Arctic Ocean. They did not want to move to a vessel they considered doomed. During the conversation, panic suddenly erupted as someone shouted that the bombers were returned. Several Alapana sailors jumped into the lifeboats and piled overboard, though the others, led by the captain, remained in their seats. The tiny dots on the horizon, mistaken for enemy planes, turned out to be just a flock of seagulls. The sailors of the Alopana returned to the ship and transferred cigarettes, bread, and water to the lifeboats, after which the transport moved on. At a quite a distance to the southwest, another tragedy played out. Submarines sank the Commodore's vessel River Afton, which was on its way to Novaya Zemlya. At 1815, quite unexpectedly, a torpedo hit the left shell of the transport. Seaman Marsh's watch was due to end at 18.0, but he was now carrying double the watch, so he remained in his place. He just returned to the gun when the explosion went off. Marsh was shaken violently, and when he looked up he saw that the stern of the vessel was gone, the port side dinghy was gone, and the four men standing at the aft 100 tomb gun were gone. They were never seen again. Marsh, along with his mate Gilbert Wake, ran to the lifeboats. Marsh helped lower the starboard dinghy while Wake dropped life rafts into the water. Their coolness saved the lives of so many. It wasn't easy to lower the dinghy because the hoist blocks were jammed. When it did touch the water, the ship was still moving and the dinghy capsized. Almost twenty people were trapped and drowned. Marsh managed to jump into the water in time and swam to one of the rafts. He was joined by three other men, including a seriously injured stoker. The second torpedo hit the engine room when the rescue equipment had already been lowered. At the order of the second mate, Seaman Adam Ogar attempted to launch a skiff, but this ding he capsized as the ship had not yet lost inertia. Together with the others, Ogang reached the raft. But the chief mate was not among the survivors. The submarine came closer and put a third torpedo into the stern of the river Ufton. Only then did Commodore Dowding agree to abandon ship. He was the last man to leave. Dowding ended up on a raft with two sailors. The submarine surfaced and approached Marsh's raft. The Germans ordered four sailors to come aboard and tell them about the River Afton's cargo. The boat commander then handed the sailors some wine and bread and took some pictures. He told them to sail straight east. It was still about 200 miles to Novaya Zemlya. The sailors asked if he could pick up the injured stoker, but the boat commander said he couldn't because he was full to the brim. Marsh was later joined by another raft and a yawl, which he managed to put on an even keel. In the dinghy was transport commander Charlton and another officer. They had difficulty in keeping the skiff on the water. There was a mass of wreckage floating about. There were also many dead bodies bobbing on the surface. A total of 14 transports were sunk on this black day. It was a terrible figure. If we add to them three ships sunk the day before, it turns out that the losses of PQ-17 equaled the losses of all the previous 16 convoys, but the beating did not end there. On Sunday afternoon, the air defence ship Poza Rica, along with its escorting corvettes and the rescue ship Ratlin, was heading east along the ice edge. Several Ju-88s, Escorted by a reconnaissance, seaplane flew past, but did not attack. Desperate calls for help from dying merchant ships came over the radio. 
the corvette's poppy and Lotus requested permission to go back to the transports, the commander of Poppy was refused. Part of the crew was upset by this and tried to persuade Lieutenant Commander N.C. Boyd to ignore the prohibition and turn the ship after all. However, for the lieutenant it was his first voyage as the commander of the ship and he did not dare to disobey the captain of the first rank with four patches. The irritation of the officers of the poppy was so great that they openly accused Captain Pozariki of saving his own skin at the cost of the loss of defenseless transports. But when the passion subsided, a little explanations were found for his position. There were more than 300 people on board the former banana carrier. So it was unwise to destroy the connection which has anti-aircraft air defence ship and anti-submarine capabilities of corvettes. However, the commander of the Lotus, Lieutenant G. J. Hall, was the escort commander, so he had some latitude. Hall turned his corvette back right into the claws of the German battleship, as it was thought at the time. However, he wanted to give the transports what help he could. Lotus had not gotten too far when the Poserik took the Admiralty's warning. The most probable time of appearance of enemy ships is the night of July 5 X or early morning of July 6. The commander of the Posarica, Lawford, used a megaphone to outline the situation to the commanders of the Corvettes and the Ratlin. It was clear that they should not attempt to pass directly into the White Sea now. They should move along the edge of the ice and go to Novaya Zemlya, perhaps trying to find shelter in the narrow strait Matochkin share, separating the two islands. It was decided that the plan of further action would not be determined until after arrival at Novaya Zemlya. If the ships could not proceed further south, the crews would disembark and continue the journey on foot. At 18.0, the commander of the Pozariki told the crew by broadcast everything he knew himself. He said that in the event of an encounter with enemy destroyers, the ship had some chance of fighting back, but an encounter with a line ship could have only won out. Therford made a strange joke, and the crew chuckled nervously as they listened to him. In this way, the men tried to hide their fear. The captain advised the sailors to get a good night's sleep and to prepare for their meeting with the creator just in case. Now the four ships were following in a tight column. This formation had been deliberately chosen. Lawford wanted to try to deceive the enemy, making him believe that in front of him a real squadron of warships. About an hour later, radio operators Pozariki received another radiogram and the loudspeakers told the team the good news. The Russian submarine Red Star radioed that she had hit the Tirpitz with two torpedoes. The battleship slowed down and the rest of the German ships gathered around it. Everyone squealed with joy. But several hours passed and there was no confirmation of this message. Sailors again began anxiously looking over the horizon expecting to see silhouettes of German battleships. When two masts were seen, a slight panic arose. Everyone waited nervously for the observers to identify the sighted vessel. It turned out to be the transport Samuel Chase. As the transport came closer, it asked if it could join. And now five ships, somewhere north of the 77th parallel, were moving towards the unknown Novaya Zemlya. They pressed to the very edge of the ice, but still there was a skirmish with a submarine chasing the chase. Suddenly a torpedo was sighted coming toward the transport from the south. The Samuel Chase managed to dodge. The torpedo hit a wall of ice and exploded, dropping a mass of broken ice into the sea. Poppy drove the boat under the ice, firing several shots from her 102M gun. Meanwhile, it became clear that the rat could not keep up with the given speed, and the rescue vessel began to fall behind little by little. At quite a distance from the Pozariki group were our three trawlers. 
the Lord Austin, Lord Middleton, and Nuff and Jem. We were moving quite slowly, listening to distant explosions, followed by columns of black smoke on the horizon. On the Gem, two lifeboats were prepared for immediate launching. As the sea was calm and there was practically no rocking, they were lowered to the level of the deck ladders. The dinghies were loaded with provisions, clothing, blankets, water, rum, rifles and cartridges, tobacco and cigarettes. Each man wore extra clothing. Life jackets lay close at hand. The second mechanic of the gem, who had already retired but was called up again, put all his papers, including his pension book, into a gummed bag and hung it around his neck. Middleton and we too loaded the lifeboats with additional supplies and prepared them for immediate launching. All the secret documents were stowed in special cargo bags to be thrown overboard if necessary. As we approached the edge of the ice sheet, we had to move very carefully to avoid hitting huge ice flows. They glistened in the sun so brightly that it was painful to look at them. Soon we passed a huge iceberg, and then the bells of a loud battle rang out. Three German planes headed towards us but flew past, deciding to attack a merchant ship visible on the horizon. Soon receiving a distress call, we learned that it was the Pancroft. Another group of Ju-88s flew in, but the transport at this time was already standing motionless on our traverse. Only black smoke was spiralling up into the sky. We could see the planes descending to attack, the bombs falling. They exploded around the ship one after another. Then some of the planes turned back. Would they attack us? One of the signalmen stood on the deck, clutching a bag to his chest. In it lay a puffy red book of naval ciphers. The signalman was ready to throw the bag into the water if the planes came down. Not yet, shouted to him from the bridge. It's still early, so the planes flew high above us. Not a single bomb was dropped. Apparently, the pilots just did not pay attention to the slowly creeping small ships. Around the Pancraft, over which the airplanes were still circling, several bubbles swelled on the ocean surface. These could have been submarines or seaplanes intent on capturing the vessel. But as we got closer, it became clear that they were lifeboats. As we approached, they turned to meet us. Our skipper told the Lord Middleton that if we picked up the survivors, he might sink the stricken vessel. There was no reply, but then the Middleton signalled us to change course, turning almost straight back. Our captain was extremely surprised, as he believed it was his duty to go directly to the assistance of the merchant vessel. He asked the Gem if he would go with us to rescue the men, as he intended to ignore the order. But Jem replied that he would obey the officer in charge, so all three trawlers turned and headed for the fog line. This was too much for our captain. He bravely turned back and went single-handedly toward the Pancraft. We presented a perfect target as we travelled those two miles. The airplanes seemed to have used up all their bombs because they started firing machine guns at the ship. We could all see this clearly. Then the bombers stopped firing and flew toward us. We couldn't believe it when they sped past without opening fire. Then the Middleton and Jem joined us. As we approached the dinghies, however, they suddenly turned and began to move away. Then the Corvette Lotus appeared, heading straight for the damaged transport. Its searchlight flashed. The Corvette promised to take care of the sailors. He advised us to move further east, reporting an admiralty radiogram stating that the Tirpitz, along with her escort ships, was catching up with us at 25 knots. This was the first we had heard of it, as our receivers were too bad. Only later did we learn the reasons for such strange behaviour of the sailors in the dinghies. They could not read our signals and mistook us for submarines about to torpedo the Pancraft. When the Lotus arrived, the crew of the Pancraft saw us pointing our guns at each other. 
and then they were terrified that they would be in the lifeboats right in the centre of a fierce artillery battle. Otis began to shoot the stationary pancraft, which soon blazed brightly. Very quickly the corvette took on board all the survivors and then rushed past us at eighteen knots. We were giving half that we transmitted an order by searchlight to leave the area as quickly as possible, as two enemy battleships and eight destroyers were coming this way. In farewell Lotus wished us good luck. It was not necessary to remind us again that we should get away as quickly as possible. Three extra men were put to each furnace, and for the next few hours we had the clanking of the flaps in our ears. The boilers were devouring coal at an incredible rate. Our safety valves were screwed on tight. The machines shook as if they were going to break the bottom of the trawler. Smoke was billowing from the chimney in a giant cloud, and the hissing of steam could be heard all over the ship. The chief mechanic swore that this old fag would sooner go up in flames. He squeezed out an absolutely fantastic speed of twelve knots. That was more than the Lord Austin had ever made in her entire life. But the machinery couldn't take the strain for too long. That's how we literally flew in the morning of the next day, July 6. Blobs of ice and streaks of fog at times hid the other trawlers from us. But we had already worked out a general plan of action. We were to go to Matochkin Shah Strait and there to stand under the shore, having extinguished boilers. We wanted to wait until the German activity died down. If necessary, we could leave the ships and go ashore to walk to the nearest village. It was not a very attractive prospect, but it was still better than freezing to death in a dinghy. Then several more airplanes flew past us. Some of them descended to get a closer look at us, but then they were gone. Rarely have we been made to realize so emphatically that we were not real warships. But gradually we began to seriously fear that the German command would get tired of the constant reports of three spotted trawlers and send someone to get rid of us. At one point the Middleton was alone, and immediately the signalman shouted, Enemy airplane. The airplane, he reported, began transmitting something by searchlight. The captain and signalman were called upstairs. They began trying to make out what the German was transmitting. What the devil does he want? The captain asked. The signalman took a closer look and replied, My bad, sir, I can't make it out. He's probably transmitting in German. In that case, he's not signalling to us, but to someone else over the horizon. His own ships, Bozun, ditch the lifeboats, prepare secret documents for destruction. The crew must be ready to abandon ship immediately on my order, ordered the captain. It took some time before things cleared up. The panic proved to be premature. The mysterious signals were just sun bunnies on the glazing of the airplane cockpit. Everyone blushed with embarrassment. A little later, four bombers appeared over Austin when we were also travelling alone. They didn't attack us, though, probably trying to find something more interesting to do. Before we could catch our breath, the Admiralty dropped a new bucket of ice water on our heads. We received a radiogram with a message that three enemy destroyers are between us and Novaya Zemlya. Well, how are we supposed to get there? We were still going at full steam. The ship shuddered as if the boilers were going to explode in the next second. Black smoke billowed from the chimney and sparks flew. It covered us better than any smoke screen. Finally, at 19.50, we saw land, and in three hours we approached the rocky shores of the northern island of Novaya Zemlya. The chief mechanic categorically stated that we should clean the furnaces, otherwise the boilers would not hold. We stopped so that the stokers could do it. All the time while the trawler was standing we were terribly nervous. There was dead silence which was only occasionally broken by a quiet creak. It was the helmsman accidentally touching the wheel. From time to time the sound of hammering came from below. 
this sound could easily reach the ears of an underwater hunter. And in addition, it turned out that we stopped at the exact place where, according to the Admiralty, should be three German destroyers. Our commander spoke to the Middleton and Hem with the help of a megaphone. And finally we were on our way again, following the other trawlers. We walked along the rocky, unfriendly coast, looking for the Strait of Matochkin Ball. The name was as unfamiliar to us as the land we were looking at. None of us had ever heard of this godforsaken island before. We found some passage that resembled the place we sought. But all we had at our disposal was an ancient map from 1904 on which the only landmark was marked, a wooden lighthouse on a cliff. And we saw two towers, and no sign of life. No one knew exactly what we had found. Then someone shouted from the gem that a new radiogram had been received. The enemy compound was operating only ten miles away, practically within line of sight. All three trawlers immediately put up steam. Then someone tracked down a more recent chart, and our skipper signaled to Lord Middleton, the senior officer. He suggested that he should lead us round the rocky headland, but the Middleton twice replied that our trawler should take the lead. They stop our doubts. He even stepped aside to let us pass. The reason for such strange behaviour of the commander was found out later. The Middleton had thrown overboard all the cipher books and therefore simply could not answer the call of another ship. So the Lord Austin moved forward. All the guns were at full readiness. Suddenly a searchlight flashed from behind a rock. What ship? It was the Corvette Poppy, guarding the entrance to the strait. We were safe. For the first time we realised that the morning was truly wonderful. Although it was 2 a.m., the sun was burning so brightly that many of us had burned our faces. At this time of year in the Arctic, it makes no sense to talk about time. Hours and minutes turned into meaningless numbers on maps, marking the distance travelled. The entire crew of the trawler gathered on deck. We exchanged signals with Poppy, who asked, So how was your time? Sufficiently shitty. How about you? No better. But it seems to be over now. Yeah, it's cosy here. Then we rounded the cape, and the sunny morning shone with new colours. About a dozen ships from the convoy were peacefully anchored in the strait. These were air defence ships Palomaras and Pozarica, all three minesweepers, Halcyon, Salamander, and Britomart, Corvette La Maluin, rescue ship Zamalek but only five transports, the Ocean Freedom, Samuel Chase, Hoosier, El Capitan, and Benjamin Harrison. That's all that's left? When we passed the air defence ships, they shouted, that was a long haul. What the hell were you doing fishing? A few minutes later the anchor slipped out of the fair lead. Everyone who wasn't on watch rushed downstairs to their bunks. All we wanted was to get some sleep. N.I.T. The Palomares was the first to arrive at Matochkin Ball. Most of the journey he made alone, dragging behind him seaplane Valro's cruiser London. There was a slight panic on the ship when an observer in the crow's nest saw the ship catching up from behind. An artillery warrant officer was sent to the mast who reported that it was definitely a warship. Everyone decided that the enemy had finally caught the Palomares and waited tensely for the stranger to approach. Soon it began to signal, and it became clear that it was the mine's weeper salamander. His 102 m gun had jammed and he was requesting permission to join. Finally three or four ships gathered and together they headed for the strait. As the Palomares approached Matoka Ball, the navigator discovered that the charts were full of errors. The height of the mountains was several times higher than indicated on the charts. This was another proof that this area of the Arctic British fleet did not know at all. Therefore, the ships could not make good use of their radars. Very cautiously, Palomares entered the strait. 
bypassing the cape protruding into the sea and anchored, choosing a place so that it was not visible from the sea. Armor-piercing shells were fed to the guns in case the enemy did appear, and then the rest of the ships began to arrive. The inhabitants of the little Russian village on the shore of the southern island were not in the least surprised at the sudden invasion. The village was nothing more than a bunch of rotting wooden buildings where the hunters lived with their wives, children, and dogs. A Soviet-flagged merchant ship stood at a small dock. Some of the arriving British vessels were inspected by a Russian naval officer. This colourful figure, in a long black overcoat, circled the strait in a small motorboat with a machine gun. He spoke no English, but he understood whiskey perfectly. When the Britomart raised the Soviet flag as a courtesy, the officer was flattered. His entire crew, consisting of one sailor, was perfectly happy when the English sailors treated him to cigarettes. Following the Palam as the first of the transports came the El Capitan and the Benjamin Harrison. Then came the Salamander along with the Ocean Freedom, followed by the Hoosier, the Zamalek, and the Pozariki group. The Palomares radar operator detected the Pozariki's radar emissions long before the ship approached the strait. Like warships, merchant ships came to Novaya Zemlya with a variety of intentions. The Hoosier headed north first. Several times it encountered heavy ice, though it enjoyed the shelter of blizzards and fog. Moving through the ice, the Hoosier encountered other vessels, but soon broke away from them again. Its skipper intended to anchor at Matochkin Ball, and from there sent a radiogram calling for help. The skipper of the El Capitan was also going to find some bay to take refuge in and wait about a week before attempting to pass into the White Sea. The Panamanian dry cargo ship took advantage of every scrap of fog and changed course frequently to avoid areas from which distress calls of attacked vessels were heard. The sailors gained renewed vigour and became more optimistic about the future when a small group of ships gathered in the strait. Shortly after the arrival of the three trawlers, hopes were rekindled when the Lotus arrived with over 80 rescued people on board. The deck of the corvette was literally packed with people. The corvette was greeted with loud shouts as it slowly made its way through the strait. After rescuing the crew of the Pancraft and shooting the damaged transport, the Lotus encountered a mass of floating debris and half-frozen river often sailors on life rafts. The sailors' ordeal lasted more than five hours. The rescued were distributed to the larger ships where they were warmly welcomed by the crews. The sailors had lost everything, so dry clothes and hot food seemed the height of bliss to them. Aboard the Pozariki, the rescued earned general respect as they volunteered for combat duty. An American Indian from the Pancraft, whom the comrades called Cherokee, stood up to the machine gun. It turned out that he handled the machine gun better than the regular machine gunner. Salamander also transferred the rescued men to the transports. In the strait gathered all the escort ships, excluding the trawler Ayesha and Corvette Dianella. Now eleven ships had to guard the five surviving transports and the salvage vessel, so all thoughts of abandoning the ship and moving ashore immediately disappeared. In the same way we rejected the idea of sitting out in the strait for a few days until the enemy's actions ceased. We were corked there, as in a bottle, had no room for manoeuvre in case of an enemy air raid. Submarines could guard us at the exit of the strait at the moment of departure. Therefore there was no option but to leave Matochkin Ball as quickly as possible. The Palomars detected a German airplane searching for us. He slipped between two hills in the throat of the strait, but, fortunately, did not see our ships. The severely reduced ammunition was another factor that spoke in favour of an early breakthrough into the White Sea. The situation on most ships was about the same. For example, 
the Halcyon had already used up half of its 102M shells. He arrived in Matochkin Shah on the remnants of fuel, and other ships were not better. At 11.00 a.m., just a few hours after its arrival, a meeting of the captains was held aboard the Pozariki. A plan of action was drawn up to bring the rest of the convoy to Archangelsk. Someone at the meeting even proposed to sink the ships and move ashore, but this proposal was not heard. Palomar sent a radiogram to the head of the British Maritime Mission in northern Russia. In response, he was indicated the course, which was to move to Archangels. Messages were transmitted through the radio station on shore, as the use of ships' radios could attract the attention of the Germans. It was decided to put to sea at 18.0. On the Lord Austin, new commands were hers. Rise, load coal. A superhuman effort was required of the men who had scarcely had time to close their eyes to raise themselves to an upright position. It was done, however, and the exhausted crew, cursing at every opportunity, crawled up the gangways to the top. We came aboard the Ocean Freedom, which also had coal boilers. Soon sacks of coal began to be thrown over to our board. We exchanged the last rumours and sent cigarettes and tobacco to the transport, as the sailors of the merchantman had smoked everything to the ground. No one knew exactly where the new nickname of Matochkin Share Strait was born. Either in the cabin of the skipper of the Freedom, or in the wardroom of the Austin, it was called Coward's Cove. As we were utterly exhausted, we managed to take only ten tons of coal from the Freedom. This stock would hardly have been enough to reach Archangels. Valros, which the Palomares had dragged along for several hundred miles, was hoisted on the deck of the Freedom. This transport was designated as the flagship of a reformed convoy of seventeen ships. We planned first to go southward along the coast of Novaya Zemlya, so that the open sea and submarines would be on our starboard side only. Then, moving the same way southward, we were to reach the Russian coast and their turn westward to the throat of the White Sea. At the appointed time, we left Coward's Cove. The Lord Austin was assigned to close the convoy, so we were the last to leave our temporary shelter. Ek, I see. Meanwhile, outside the shelter at Matochkin Ball, the carnage continued. Although several of our ships had managed to take shelter in the strait the day before, July 6, German planes continued to find prey. Pan-Atlantic followed a southwesterly course and was south of the strait, intending to break into the White Sea. The skipper counted on the support of Russian aircraft. However, instead of Russian airplanes, he met German planes, which immediately rushed to attack. On Atlantic received at least one direct hit and caught fire, sinking a few minutes later. As the crew was abandoning ship, the young third mechanic Richard Talon discovered that one of the sailors was without a life jacket. He immediately gave the sailor his own, saying with a chuckle that he had swum a lot in the Mobile River, so why not swim in the Barents Sea? The brave fellow was never seen again. Early in the morning of July 7, just when our trawlers were entering the Strait of Matokin Shah, the beating of transports resumed. The baton from the plains was intercepted by submarines, which rushed to Novaya Zemlya, looking for the fleeing transports. Beta 20M, the British ship Huttlebury, was sailing alone toward the southern island. So far, the vessel was completely unharmed. A multitude of observers were scrutinizing the horizon, but doom crept up unnoticed. Two torpedoes hit the ship. Artilleryman Arthur Carter had changed watch and was asleep when the explosions went off. The first thing he saw when he opened his eyes were tongues of flame shooting from a torn bulkhead. He was dressed in army pants, a shirt and a thick sweater, with socks and booties on his feet. But when Carter jumped out of his bunk, his first thought was for his life jacket. He must find it. Carter grabbed the vest, 
and rushed upstairs. In his haste, however, he didn't notice the vest snagging on the handrail, and Carter had to go back to pick up the vest that had been ripped out of his hands. When he finally reached the upper deck, the Huttlebury was already on a 45-degree roll. The crew began to abandon ship. Carter saw that one of his familiar gunners was stunned and unaware of what was happening. The debris-filled deck was covered with a layer of flour and water and had become so slippery it was almost impossible to stay on your feet. Several sailors were lowering the dinghy, but suddenly the bow hoists broke off and she hung vertically. Under frightened cries, they managed to lower the second dinghy normally. But it turned out that the hole in the bottom was not closed with a plug. When the sailors began to descend into the dinghy by rope, it began to sink. The ship kept moving. Carter saw a life raft on the tank, whose fasteners were loose and the raft was slipping into the water. Exactly how Carter climbed onto it, he himself does not remember. As the raft moved away from the ship, a third torpedo struck the transport. There was a terrible explosion. Huttlebury broke in half and quickly disappeared under the water. Carter's raft was packed with thirteen men one of whom was the first mate. Carter was relieved to see that the concussed gunner was on the other raft. However, he later learned that his friend had passed away and was buried at sea. Shortly after the Huttlebury sank, the submarine rose to the surface. There were several men on the bridge, and two were pointing a machine gun at the rafts. The British were terrified as they remembered the newspaper headlines screaming about the shootings of the rescued crews. Carter was convinced that it was at this point that he began to turn grey. The boat, which had a wolf's head painted on its deckhouse, drew closer, and the three officers took turns asking questions in English. What was the name of the ship? Where were you headed? Why were you sailing to Russia since you are not Bolsheviks? One of the officers pointed in which direction the land was. He asked if they had a compass and regretted that he could not take prisoners because there was no room on the submarine. Then two bottles of schnapps and seven loaves were handed to the rescuers. They were filmed with a movie camera and then the submarine left. It was the first mate who rescued 13 men, many of whom were dressed too lightly. Two pieces of tarpaulin were found in a locker on the raft. One of them was folded in two and laid on the bottom, and the second was stretched over the raft, resulting in the sailors being in a tarpaulin tent. The deputy wouldn't let anyone sleep. He kept the men singing, talking, and doing calisthenics. At this time, somewhat to the south, the transport Alcoa Ranger was on an eastward course, squeezing thirteen knots out of her machinery. It was due to reach the southern tip of Novaya Zemlya. Although it had been attacked several times by aircraft earlier, the transport had suffered no damage. It was now in an area of perfect weather where nothing seemed to threaten the ship. The sea was exceptionally calm. Suddenly two enemy reconnaissance planes appeared. One approached and circled around the ship but did not attack. The skipper of the Alco Ranger became convinced that his minutes were numbered and ordered the flag signal to be hoisted, signifying unconditional surrender. He then ordered the stars and stripes to be lowered and abandon ship. But the second mate took command and volunteered to steer the ship. The captain then changed his mind and ordered the flag to be hoisted back up, deciding to take command again. But then the ship was unexpectedly attacked by a submarine that was tracking it. At 8.30 a torpedo hit the starboard side of the transport, making a large hole and causing a strong roll. The ship immediately lost steam as the machinery became. A distress signal was sent over the radio. Secret documents were thrown overboard in an iron box as the crew abandoned ship. To everyone's indignation, the captain did not supervise the evacuation, which still ended safely. 
The submarine then rose to the surface and began shooting the ship with its gun. The rescued sailors counted more than 60 shells hitting the ship. It seemed that the German gunners decided to give themselves a little drill. Three hours later, the Alcoa Ranger sank nose first, just as the captains began a meeting at Matochkin Ball. The submarine approached the captain's dinghy, and the commander asked in broken English the name of the ship, the port of destination and the nature of the cargo. The survivors were photographed several times. They were pointed in the direction of the nearest land and asked if they had enough food. The boat then quickly sailed southward. A brief lull followed, but the submarines patrolling off the island went nowhere. However, another Liberty-type transport, the John Witherspoon, had already chosen the fateful course that led to its demise. After the disbandment of the convoy, it first turned north and then east to seek refuge off the coast of Novaya Zemlya. These directions could only be spoken of in a very relative way. Sailor O'Flaherty, who was standing at the helm, noticed that the magnetic compass arrow was going almost 80 degrees on the cartouche. Only the keel jet Arston indicated exactly where the ship was heading. O'Flaherty asked the first mate, Don't you think it would be better if I looked back and somehow tried to equalize course? To this the first mate replied venomously, There's no point. We won't get to Russia anyway. After a while he noticed that O'Flaherty was heading straight toward some point ahead. The aide asked O'Flaherty what it was. A cloud O'Flaherty replied, Have you heard anything about cloud navigation? Then look back at the Kielvator jet. You'll see that the ship is travelling more directly than before. That was enough for the aide and he decided to get on with the paperwork. If there was enough time, by measuring the height of the sun, the true course could be calculated. However, everyone realized that there was no time. German reconnaissance planes were constantly circling on the horizon, and the sailors did not immediately realize that soaring seagulls can look just like approaching enemy planes. When the mistake was discovered, all the sailors began to scold the innocent birds in an elaborate manner. But the John Witherspoon still managed to elude the German planes, although it was at that moment when the last plane disappeared and the sky became completely deserted. The feeling of imminent danger became only more acute. All sailors realized that the ship could be attacked by a submarine at any moment. The nervousness of the last three days was taking its toll, and people were looking more and more often at the lifeboats. And yet when the ship was attacked in the afternoon of July 7, it was completely unexpected. At 16.15 a torpedo hit the hold no, three on the starboard side. From the impact, the transport tilted sharply to the left side, people and equipment flew into the sea. Then the ship tilted to the starboard side. The bulwark went into the water and the ship began to describe circles on the spot like a wounded bird. The torpedo could have broken the transport in half if the no. Three hold had not contained a load of automobile tires. The tires absorbed much of the shock wave, and many of the tires were ejected through the breach. All the sailors had been waiting for this for so long that they sprang into action before the watch officer had even pressed the button for the loud bells. The stern gun fired a single shot at the object, which the gunners mistook for a submarine. They had no time to do anything more, for the great roll put all the artillery out of action. The two starboard lifeboats were hanging on their hoists, but one was smashed to pieces and the other was badly damaged. The sailors were sure that the submarine would fire the next torpedo into the port side, where the two lifeboats still survived, so they acted rather hastily. The entire crew piled into these two dinghies. Only the captain remained standing on the bridge wing. One life raft was also lowered into the sea. Fletty, along with another sailor, were in the lower rooms when the ship was hit by a torpedo. 
When they jumped out on deck, it was discovered that both had not put on life jackets. It must have taken several minutes to lower the lifeboats, so O'Flaherty rushed back to his cabin. In an emergency, everyone was supposed to grab the nearest vest, and O'Flaherty was surprised to find that his vest was missing somewhere. He rushed back to the dinghy deck, determined to retrieve his vest the same way someone had borrowed it. The sailors were still fiddling with the dinghy, and O'Flaherty rushed down again, searching one cabin after another. Nothing. Then he dashed out on deck again to see how much time he had left. The sudden need to leave the ship literally blows up routine life, and people begin to act more than strangely. Still, the sailors looked suspiciously at the fumbling O'Flaherty, who ran up and down the gangways for no apparent purpose. For the third time he went down to the cabins, this time on the port side, and grabbed a vest lying on a chair. No man took off up the gangway as quickly as O'Flaherty did. He dashed to the dinghy deck and jumped into the last dinghy, which the men on the hoists were already preparing to launch. The captain came down from the bridge, but remained on board, gesturing for the dinghies to cast off. Just at this time, the mechanic and stoker came out of the superstructure, who were probably stunned. In the confusion, the dinghy was lowered too quickly, and the two sailors standing on the tallies had to jump into the water. The stoker suddenly came to his senses, ran to the life raft and lowered it. Then, together with the mechanic, he grabbed the captain, and they made him jump overboard too. One of the sailors who had lowered the lifeboats fainted from shock at the cold water. The sailors dismantled the oars and went after him. The second ding he picked up his companion, but the first one died. The waves threw him off the dinghy and carried him away. The sailors did not see him give the slightest sign of life. The ship was still circling in place. Then, as expected, the Germans fired a second torpedo. The sailors in one of the dinghies heard it hiss under the bottom, heading for the transport. It exploded with a rumble all the way into the same no tree hold, but this time off the port side. The John Witherspoon failed to die with dignity. Her hull cracked and folded like a pent knife. The bow and stern nearly met in midair. After the second torpedo hit, the ship went down like a stone. The submarine surfaced and the sailors saw a wolf's head painted on the deckhouse. The Germans pointed a gun at the survivors, filming them with a movie camera. Then the commander asked in good English, Is anyone wounded? No, replied the radio operator. Do you need food or water? No. How much cargo was on board? I don't know. The German nonchalantly took out a sheet of paper and read them a complete list of the ship's cargo. Then he asked, We don't know. In reality, the captain had laid himself down in the bottom of the second lifeboat to avoid being captured. All the ship's officers wore clothing without insignia. The submarine commander regarded the rescued sailors as his boat passed within fifty feet of the lifeboats. He then pointed in the direction with his hand, reporting, Land over there. The German officer waved his hand and disappeared down the hatch. The waves splashed and the submarine slowly submerged. When the excitement of the ship's demise passed, the sailors realized that they were alone in the cold in the vast sea. At the same time, a few miles to the north, the last tragedy of the day played out. It happened almost exactly in the path of our reformed convoy leaving Matochkin Strait. After the crews of the Washington, the Bolton Castle, and the Porus Potter had refused to transfer to the Olapana, the transport had travelled several hundred miles and was already near the coast of Navaya Zemblia. Its voyage passed rather nervously. At first, the crew panicked and even tried to abandon ship. Captain Stone discussed the situation with the British gunners. 
They firmly stated that it was their duty to stand by the guns as long as the ship stayed afloat. This slightly calmed the panic-stricken men and lifted the spirits of the crew. The gunners suggested that in the event of an airplane attack, the captain should launch the boats and light smoke bombs on deck to make it look as if the ship had been hit. This proved to be the smartest thing to do after it was discovered that bullets simply bounced off the attacking planes. The smoke bomb's ploy was put to the test, and it worked. On the afternoon of July 7, after the Heinkel attack, the sailors again lit a smoke bomb on the tank. The pilot probably thought the ship was doomed because he never came back. However, the radio operator of the Olapana heard him transmitting something to the submarine. So the end was clearly around the corner. At 22.55, a torpedo hit the starboard side of the transport, killing all the men in the stoker room. Several other sailors and one gunner were killed. Gunner Edward Hennessy was asleep in the radio room when the torpedo exploded. He had changed watch and the radio room was very close to his gun. He jumped out onto the deck and found it in chaos. An explosion had thrown the starboard dinghy to the deck, shattering it into splinters. Hennessy peered over the bulwark to see where the torpedo had hit, but saw only clouds of vapour. The engine room hatch also showed nothing but billowing steam. In a panic, Someone gave away the bow hoists of the portside lifeboat, and she went off into the water. One life raft was lost, but the remnants of the crew managed to position themselves on the other three raft. She and the submarine surfaced, and the sailors saw a wolf's head on the deckhouse. For fifteen minutes it shot at the sinking vessel. When the Germans finished their artillery exercises, Olapana was all engulfed in flames and was sinking stern first. Clouds of yellow smoke billowed from the broken chemical drums on the half bank. The boat approached the rafts, and again the traditional questions were heard, no, are you Bolsheviks? No, so why are you helping Russia? The commander asked if they had enough food and pointed in the direction of the shore. In parting, he caustically reported, all the ships of your convoy are long ago at the bottom of the sea. It was a Parthian arrow that increased the sailors' misery. Olapana was the 22nd ship of the convoy, sunk by the Germans. 22nd, but not the last. As soon as our reformed convoy left Coward's Cove, it was almost immediately spotted by submarines, despite the haze. Austin was the last of the ships to pass the narrow strait, and we had a perfect view of the enemy's ship quite close by. When one of the corvettes opened fire, the boat was leisurely submerged. Then there were more reports of boats sighted nearby. It was these that now became our main threat, as word came that the enemy's heavy ships had returned to the anchorage. Gradually the haze turned to fog and this old enemy of all sailors was now our best friend. If it holds out for the rest of our voyage, maybe the last leg of the journey will be calm. Before midnight the fog thinned a little, but then grew thicker. Our ships were now struggling to avoid collisions. We almost hit the Zamalek ourselves. The Benjamin Harrison had broken away from the others. Its skipper tried unsuccessfully for twelve hours to find the convoy, and then turned back into the strait, not wishing to take any more risks in a solo voyage. By the next morning, July 8, the visibility had improved a little and was just what we needed. We could see each other, but at the same time a veil of fog completely obscured us from the air. We prayed hard to the god of fogs that it would stay that way. Now that the immediate danger was over, each of us found that we were still suffering severely from permanent sleep deprivation. We managed to get a three-hour nap, but that only made people worse. They had spent three days on their feet and were close to the limit of their endurance. The worst was the helmsman. They were forced to stare at a brightly lit circle of cartouche that floated in front of their eyes, having a hypnotizing effect. 
It took all their willpower not to fall asleep on their feet. In the afternoon the fog became dense and heavy again, and it became noticeably colder. Sirens wailed, we managed to reduce speed at the last moment in order not to ram the ship ahead of us, which shouted. Look, the ice is coming. In a few minutes we found ourselves in the thick of pack ice, which grew thicker and thicker as we moved forward. Soon all the ships were forced to turn every now and then to avoid colliding with another ice flow, but pretty soon we were ensnared. The sirens wailed again. We on the Austin had a few unpleasant seconds when a large transport came out of the fog right under our noses. We couldn't manoeuvre, so we had to stop the cars immediately. Then suddenly the lookout screamed. We were drifting stern first right into a solid iceberg. The Austin was rocking on the wave, and if it had touched this monster for a moment, the ice would have cut off our rudder and propeller in an instant. We were saved by the ingenuity of signalman Gordon Hooper, who rushed to the signal searchlight and transmitted and sows to the nearest ship. There the situation was instantly assessed and the ship turned away. This allowed us to give way again and avoid hitting the iceberg at the last moment. The Lord Middleton has had similar unpleasant experiences. Completely surrounded by ice, it was creeping along at six knots, and any stop would have been fatal. Suddenly the alarm bells rang and the carcass of a large transport appeared out of the fog. Neither ship could stop or back up, as the ice would have mutilated the propellers. Likewise they could not turn aside. Both of the trawler's small dinghies were immediately swept overboard and the crew prepared to abandon ship but by some miracle the transport's captain had time to react. He increased his speed, hoping that the transport would skip past the point of impact before the trawler approached it. It was a bold decision, and luck smiled on the skipper. The transport passed directly under the bow of the Middleton, the ships being separated at this point by no more than two yards. If the transport had struck the side of the trawler, it would have simply flipped her over, without getting a scratch herself. The ships battling the ice tried to maintain contact by foghorns and by radio. It was probably at this time that we gave away our plans to the enemy. As the Lord Austin moved back, we ran into the ice fields again. We had to turn constantly at the commands of the observers standing on the tank. The grey haze and the extreme fatigue of the sleep-deprived men helped the ice flows to take the most bizarre shapes. Sometimes the observers reported that they saw a submarine ahead, and once we received a report of a torpedo boat coming straight at us. It gradually became very cold, but the most important thing for us was not to lose sight of the other ships. To break away from the convoy would be extremely risky. A radiogram was intercepted warning that enemy ships were close by. The constant headache was the coal supply. We were turning around too often and turning back altogether, reducing our already meagre supply. Will we ever get to Russia? All the other 15 ships were fighting the ice on their own. The transports El Capitan and Samuel Chase won their battle, but the Hoosier lost hers miserably. When the ship did come to land, Captain Holmgren approached the shore and signalled but received no reply. Then people appeared on the deserted shore. It was the southernmost tip of Novaya Zemlya. The captain went ashore and tried to explain himself with gestures, but was unsuccessful. He then returned to the ship and followed the others. Under these trying conditions, our friends on the ocean freedom suffered the most. Our friends on the ocean freedom. The vessel had previously been sailing with the trawler Nuff and Gem, and the trawler was holding on to her left cramboil. One of the Gem's sailors succinctly remarked, There is no room to spare in this ocean. When the vessels first emerged from the fog, they were still travelling together, but the other ships were no longer visible. All the sailors felt extremely uncomfortable 
and was sure they were being watched. Then the captain saw a new strip of fog on the left side of the bow and rushed there at full speed. But there was ice there. The Freedom dropped speed and began to wade between the ice flows, moving in the fog by feel. It was more nerve-wracking than all the previous trials. At times it seemed to the men that the ice completely surrounded them. It was like wandering through a maze. At one point the transport found itself next to a trawler, also stuck in the ice. The large size and great mass of the merchant vessel caused the trawler to fly off to the side, but was freed. Captain Walker decided to increase his speed and put the gem behind him in case they encountered ice again. This happened soon enough. Following in thick fog, the Freedom struck thick pack ice. Fortunately, the trawler was coming alongside at the time, not astern, or it would have rammed the transport. Instead, the gem went out on the ice almost to the foremost. He gave reverse, and helmsman Kerslake went to the bow to inspect the forepeak. The compartment was perfectly dry, no breaches or damage. The old ship had once again bailed out her crew. Yes, in Bremerhaven they knew how to build reliably, but that was not the case with the Freedom. When it hit the ice, it crushed its stem. Spannels and plating of both sides were crumpled and crushed. The forepeak immediately flooded. The chief mate and the ship's carpenter surveyed the damage, and the XO reported to the bridge. The forepeak is flooded, but the bulkhead is holding, and the next compartment is dry. Try to make a move. Captain Walker moved the vessel cautiously forward, gradually increasing her speed. A new report followed. The bulkhead is holding. Let's go full ahead. As the fog began to thin, both vessels increased speed in an attempt to catch up with us. Although freedom speed was limited by the damaged bow, it was enough to keep ahead of the trawler. The Palomars had several dangerous moments in the fog. The ship was travelling directly behind the stern of the Posarica when it crashed into the ice barrier. The sailors in the forward compartments were knocked off their feet by the impact. There was such a rumble on the lower decks that it took some time before people were sure that the ship had not been hit by a torpedo. But the Palomars was solidly built and withstood the impact although it took a great effort to pull the ship out of the ice pincers. There were many unhelpful comments about the Russians, for it was they who had indicated the course which had led the convoy straight into the ice. Pazarica turned hastily, nearly ramming her comrade and moved on at a slow rate of speed. Sailor Gooch stood on the tanker's lookout. He froze with horror when the El Capitan suddenly emerged from the fog and passed so close to the Pozarique that Gooch could have touched it with his hand. But again the Pozarica was lucky and a collision was avoided. When a window appeared in the fog, they saw a lifeboat under a red sail almost directly under the foretop of the air defence ship. The people in it started shouting and waving their arms. They were nineteen of the John Witherspoon's crew. Many of them were frostbitten and all of them were very weak. They were picked up by the El Capitan. All the ships turned west to go around the pack ice that appeared to surround the southern tip of Novaya Zemlya. We had to go quite far west before we could turn south again to head for the entrance to the White Sea. Our convoy came to a complete standstill. We watched the ice on our port side and prayed that it would end as quickly as possible. Early in the morning of July, we came into clear water. The fog had thinned considerably, though it was still dense enough to cover us securely. We on the Austin passed a large oil slick. This was clear evidence that some vessel had been sunk here. Then the fog finally cleared, and we began to look around for our comrades, for the formation had completely disintegrated. Quite unexpectedly, it turned out that the core of the convoy was nearby, and soon we found ourselves in the company of both air defence ships and three corvettes. 
Along with us were the Lord Middleton, Britomart, Hoosier, El Capitan, and Zemalek. After a while, several black dots showed on the left. La Molouine went to check and found that they were two pan-Atlantic lifeboats. All day the corvettes were busy dropping depth bombs to ward off the submarines. We began to encounter floating logs, a clear sign that we were approaching the coast of Russia. But it was unclear how much further we had to go. We were beginning to hope that Red Air Force planes would soon appear. But when two airplanes were spotted in the afternoon, they were not Russian. Like giant locusts, the planes hovered on the horizon. We had seen something similar before. They were BV-138 and Ni-115 seaplanes. They flew around the convoy from different directions, rendezvous their stern of us and resumed tracking, continuously transmitting information to the base and submarines at sea. Almost at the same time a submarine rose to the surface nearby, but immediately submerged back. So the game started from the beginning. The main events unfolded late in the evening, when the remnants of the ill-fated convoy PQ-17 were about 80 miles from the Russian coast. The Palomar's radar detected the approaching planes, which were about 70 miles away. The long beeps of the air defense ship siren announced the danger, and then a flag signal flew up the mast. The radio operators of all the warships immediately broke radio silence, and desperate attempts to contact Archangel Skormer Mansk began. We tried to call in cover fighters. Palomares was transmitting with a key using a cipher, and with a radio telephone in plain text, in Russian and English on several waves at once. But we received no response. Whether we were given the wrong wavelengths or the Germans jammed the transmission, we can only guess. But the fact remains that our radio operators failed to establish communication with the Russians, although we desperately needed fighter cover and as quickly as possible. Sailors of the Lord Austin were searching the horizon with inflamed eyes. We didn't have to wait long. Soon we spotted five small dots in the air. Our guns opened fire, but the planes were too high for them. Bang, 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 bang. Bang, 102 M anti-aircraft guns on the air defense ships rang out. How we wished we had a gun like that. Puffs of black smoke appeared in the path of the planes, but these five did not turn off course. They were coming straight at us and when they got close to the convoy, they split up to attack from different directions. We saw one airplane take a nosedive and go into a dive, then three columns of water rose from our left nose. We heard nothing but the hull of the ship shuddered violently. Then five more dots appeared from the other direction, then another, another and another, always in fives. The Germans calmly chose the target and dive, although they did not descend too low. From each plane were separated three bombs that looked like large silver Indian clubs. Slowly at first, but then faster and faster they fell on the ship. When the bombs were halfway down, it was clear which ship had been targeted. We had to wait, holding our breath, until three huge columns of water rose into the sky completely covering the target. Then the veil of water fell away, and we saw the ship following the same course. Only the sailors on deck were shaking off after a cold shower. Pazarica tilted hard after three bombs exploded nearby, described a full circle to the left and stopped. She transmitted three very close bursts, but we think we're okay. Palomares rushed full throttle to, to check what had happened to his sister. He cut our course. From the bridge of the Palomares, they shouted hoarsely, Hey, on the Lord Austin, look out. We are cutting through the formation. Our breath caught as the air defense ship passed in front of us. We reduced our speed and turned steeply to the right. The air defense ship flew no more than 20 feet away from us. It kept firing and the plane that dropped the bombs at it missed. But those bombs whistled right at us, 
Two exploded on the sides of the Austin just ahead of us, and the third seemed to be flying straight toward us on the deck. Our radio operator, Johnny Rose, described well the few languid seconds before the bomb fell, he recorded in his diary. We saw the bomb getting bigger and bigger. I remember thinking that if I looked up with my mouth open, the bomb would hit right there, but it's doubtful that I was able to open my mouth wide enough. George stood next to me and looked up. He had a mug of hot cocoa in his hand, and he didn't realize he was pouring the contents right on top of himself. The hot liquid ran down his chest, stomach, and legs, but George didn't notice anything, although he later showed me the burns. Jock clenched the sandwich in his fist so that it leaked between his fingers. He was swearing in a way that was pleasant to listen to. Jim Morris turned out to be one of those who were not in the least perturbed by it. He glanced at the bomb and immediately turned away to follow the others that were falling around the lotus. The helmsman behind me perked up his ears to better hear orders from the bridge. He'd already put the rudder left aboard, but our old sucker was responding mockingly slow. Johnny stood behind the Lewis machine gun with one eye watching the airplane and the other eye watching the falling bomb. Sweat streamed down his face but he kept firing as the other gunners sent streams of tracer bullets toward the plane. Every now and then the skipper shouted, Keep left to port, as he watched our bow slowly turn. The 102M gun crew could do nothing. They just stood on their banquet and waited for the inevitable, not knowing whether to scatter or stay put. Huron, standing on the bridge, began untangling the ends of the halyards, repeating over and over. Jesus, my knee suddenly went weak, and my guts twisted into a painful tight ball. My head was suddenly filled with lead, and I could no longer look up. The squeal of the bomb cut painfully into my ears. Then, in a couple of seconds that seemed endless, the bomb crashed into the sea right under the bow of the trawler, raising a huge fountain that showered the ship and all of us. Strangely enough, the bomb did not explode. If it had, the entire bow would have been destroyed. But if our captain hadn't turned left a second earlier, it wouldn't have mattered if the bomb had exploded or not. It would have hit us right in the artillery cellar and taken us to the bottom with it. Soon the Pazarica gave way, and the Palomares, firing furiously, cut through the convoy formation again to return to her position. Shrapnel came down in a hail as our ships fired everything that could fire. The attack began at 9 p.m., and in just 15 minutes it was all over for the Hoosier. A wedge of enemy bombers went at it, flying so high that the small guns were simply useless. Then the planes darted into a dive and dropped bombs. Finally, a series of three bombs lay opposite No. Three lifeboat and exploded under the ship, literally throwing it out of the water. Its turbine was blown off the foundation and jammed. All steam lines burst. The fuel pump came off the base. The chief mechanic informed Captain Holmgren that the ship had lost power, and extremely reluctantly the captain gave the order to abandon ship. Bombs continued to fall all around as sailors began to go overboard into lifeboats. There was no panic, although three sailors whose nerves could not stand the strain had to be helped a little. As soon as the Hoosier went out of action and developed in steam, began to fall behind, we saw the poppy rush to her aid. The corvette was anxious to take on board the crew, who were now hastily rowing the dinghies, which were overloaded with baggage and provisions. When the cloud of vapour cleared, the captain of the poppy tried to persuade the skipper of the Hoosier to return to the vessel and see if the machinery could be fixed. But Captain Holmgren said that was impossible. It was necessary to prevent the enemy from capturing such a valuable prize. The ship, which had been left running, could have been carried to the coast of Finland, so Sub-Lieutenant Brooke was ordered to sink it with the 102M gun poppy, 
He was told where the Hoosier stored the explosives, but it still took more than 30 shells into the transport, riddling the hull before the fire started. However, the fireworks could not wait, and the corvette left the Hoosier to slowly sink. Then several horizontal bombers flew over the poppy, one of them travelling so low that Brooke thought he could be reached. I suppose the bombing of the Hoosier shifted something in my mind, because I forgot to ask the captain's permission to fire. I didn't let the gunner use the scope, but simply ordered the crew to raise the barrel of our ancient one-tomb gun in such non-military term. A little higher, a little to the right, fire. By this time the muzzle of the gun had nearly hit the bridge, so the captain and his company got a hard earful when the shock wave blew off part of the sailcloth dodger. But that was nothing compared to the blow that came over me later when the captain asked what the devil I was doing there. I watched with satisfaction as the shell exploded in front of the airplane which veered sharply to the side. I pointed this out to the captain, but he was not impressed. He simply said it was not worth wasting precious ammunition on airplanes that had already dropped bombs. Insulted, I watched in silence as the next group of planes slowly flew over Poppy, keeping strictly on I almost rejoiced when I saw three bombs separate from one of them and raise high geysers on the left side of the nose. Streams of water slammed into the half bay, but I dared not look the captain in the eye. When the poppy finally caught up with the convoy, it was still fending off the attack. The Hoosier's chief gunner and his men asked if there was anything they could do to help the corvette's crew. The help was gratefully accepted, and they were put on the ammunition supply, but many of the sailors assiduously played the part of shipwrecked men, although they got on the poppy without even getting their feet wet. This caused serious complications in Anglo-American relations. In addition, the Americans brought with them quite a lot of canned goods. Sailors' poppy had to stop them because, leaving the ship, the Americans wanted to throw the rest of the stock overboard. The seeds of misunderstanding sprouted into a lush growth. The Hoosier sank on July 10, at one. Three hours after the crew left the ship, there were two violent explosions, and the commander of the poppy came down from the bridge to tell Captain Holmgren, your ship has exploded twice and is now sinking. God bless him. May he rest in peace, replied the skipper. His entire crew marveled at the fortitude with which this old man had borne the ordeal that had broken many younger sailors. All this time the bombardment went on, hour after hour with short intervals while some planes flew away and others came in. The men at the guns between attacks barely had time to change machine gun ribbons and take a couple of puffs. And then again helmets on their heads, cigarettes out into the sights. Another group of bombers approached. The planes were attacking from a protracted dive at an angle of 85 degrees. Most of the attackers were Ju-88 bombers, although there were also new 115 seaplanes. During a lull between raids, contact was made with a submarine, and the Lotus dropped several depth bombs. Then more air quintets were sighted, which either accidentally or deliberately attacked the corvette. We saw bombs tearing around it, and it dodged. It seemed that the Lotus was bound to get hit, so close were the bursts, but it was all right. When the last three columns of water came up, the corvette was still intact and didn't even slow down. That corvette was a tough guy. The exhausted sailors of the John Witherspoon, who had been picked up by the Lay Malouin, watched the corvette dodge. Sailor of Flaherty recalls, one of the officers was lying on his back in front of the wheelhouse. He was looking through binoculars at the dive planes that were dropping bombs. If a bomb disappeared from his sight, he said nothing. If the bomb remained in front of his eyes, it meant it was falling on us. 
Then he would order the helmsman to turn to one side or the other while continuing to look straight ahead. This method eliminated the possibility of an accidental hit when doing a zig. However, it was very tiring on the eyes, and the observers had to be changed frequently. One also had to suppress the animal instincts to run and hide, especially when the bomb hatches opened, and you realize that the pilot's aim was perfectly correct. We experienced the same thing when the corvette was going through a forest of bursts, and only skillful turns, changes of speed, and the coolness of the crew saved the ship. From the Austin we saw that the Lord Middleton was saved by a mere miracle. He was going astern of us when he was attacked by three bombers, one of which flew right over the trawler. Nine bombs fell on his sides and astern. The closest hit was literally a foot off the side. We only saw one huge column of water, but the Middleton bravely went through it. One of the biggest surprises was the survivor of the Zamalik, which at times was completely hidden behind a wall of bursts. This ship was the target of several attacks, and only the miracle and skill of Captain Morris saved the ship from seemingly imminent destruction. There were more than 200 rescued people on the ship, so all the cabins and cubicles were packed. For example, in the cabin of the chief mechanic, there were eight guests. In the strictest secret, from the rescued kept the fact that the ship was 60 tons of depth bombs for Russian planes, as well as several hundred gallons of gasoline for the boat standing on the deck. When the bombs landed on the ship, the fuel lines in the engine room were severed and the generator failed. Senior mechanic A.S.S. Dawson was alone in the engine room. All other sailors were called on deck when suddenly the lights went out throughout the ship. Dawson coolly reported to the bridge about what had happened, and several mechanics from the sunken ships were sent to help him, including the senior mechanic of the Zafirana Miller. Together they repaired all the breakages. From the Austin we saw one plane turn away, fuming. It desperately tried to gain altitude but failed. The pilot and the gunner jumped out with parachutes and landed next to the Zamalek. The rescuer began to transmit. Well, if the Krauts wish, but then several bombs exploded nearby. When the bursts subsided, Zam before I was so rudely interrupted, I wanted to say that if the Krauts wished, I could turn back for them. But having received this little parcel from Fatterland, I shall leave them to sail on their own, unless they freeze. However, they can walk on water as well as on dry land. The bombardment continued. Several planes dropped mines on parachutes ahead of the convoy, so minesweepers moved to the head of the convoy to clear the way. The radio operators of the escort ships tried again to contact the Russians, and again without success during a break between raids. Someone aboard the Palomar saw blood running down the mast. Only now it was remembered that in the crow's nest sat the observer, who had not been changed since the first raid. All looked up and saw a man leaning dangerously over the rail. A large hole was visible in the decking of the platform. The crow's nest had been hit by a shell fired by one of our ships. The observer had to be lowered out of the crow's nest on a rope because he had lost too much blood. Turns out he had a big chunk of meat ripped out of his ass. Our doctor stitched him up and left him in the hospital in Arkhangelsk. Strangely enough, the sailor survived, although he acquired a severe limp. The guns of the Pozariki were firing continuously, and all the men were already deafened by the noise. The deck was completely covered with shell casings. The barrels of the guns were so hot that the paint that had fallen off hung in long tongues. Between attacks, the guns were turned against the wind so that the icy air would cool them down at least a little. By one of Lewis's twin machine guns, shell casings were already piled up to the gunner's waist. Sailors Maine and Cherokee had just reloaded Tuffy Cook's machine gun 
when Maine spotted a Ni-115 flying over the very waves. The seaplane clearly intended to drop torpedoes, aiming for the air defense ship. Maine pushed Cook, who immediately opened fire. The machine gunner put two clips into the Heinkel, 90 rounds in all, and all three saw the plane slam into the water. It immediately sank under the weight of its own torpedoes. Cook undoubtedly saved the ship, as the other guns were at this time firing on the bombers flying above. But the gunner's position was rather unpleasant, because the 102 tomb guns were firing directly over his head. When Chief Signalman Berry reported Cook's exploit to the bridge, there followed the typical British Navy dry reply, very good. Since the planes were flying too high, the Austin could not fire at them. Our gunner swore and spun his 100 tomb gun from side to side. When 1-du-88 flew low enough, we noticed that the wing consoles were painted yellow. This was the distinguishing mark of one of Goering's special squadrons. These were select pilots, but they lacked the insane courage that the torpedo crews had shown on Independence Day. The planes would come out of a dive at about 500 feet and drop their bombs, but the bombed planes continued false attacks to divert our attention from those that still had bombs. The bombs were flying down, but the fish were coming up. The underwater explosions stunned the great multitude of fish, and the entire sea was covered with dead fish floating on the surface. Even in the midst of the battle, our hungry stomachs protested against such a waste of fresh product. Now it was the turn of El Capitan and his cargo of airplanes. At the same moment, another airplane swooped down on us, and again it seemed to us that now our end was certain. But either the pilot decided not to waste his bombs on such a small target, or his bomb throwers were jammed, but he just came out of the dive. We were able to track the El Capitan. It was obscured by the water columns, but then the ship reappeared. Suddenly the planes flew away, but to our disappointment, we noticed the vessel losing speed. We received orders from the Palomaras to go to the rescue. Passed out the life nets, prepare to pick up survivors, ordered our captain. First, three bombs exploded astern of the El Capitan. Water began to flow into the aft compartments, but the situation was not yet critical. The ship repelled many more attacks, but only to receive a fatal blow during the last run after seven hours of combat. 30 p.m. when three bombs exploded 20 feet off the starboard side of the ship. The impact knocked out the kingstones and severed fuel and steam lines. The starboard side of the engine room area was destroyed, and two holes began to fill with water. The doomed transport lowered the lifeboats, and the men in them began rowing towards us. Our captain shouted into a megaphone, Grab some machine guns if you can. After some confusion, they complied with the order. We helped them aboard, grabbing them by the arms and dragging them on deck without ceremony. The empty dinghies began to drift away. Our deck was now full of people. A new order followed, prepare the 102M. The commander of the El Capitan warned us not to aim at the no. To hold, which was full of trenitratuine, or we would all go to heaven. He stood on our bridge with tears in his eyes as the shells tore through his vessel. At a distance of one cable, it's impossible to miss. We had mixed feelings when he reported that El Capitan's refrigerators still had turkeys and other delicacies from Independence Day. By this time, our rations had become quite meager. Six hits below the waterline and three in the hold were enough, and the big ship slowly disappeared under the water. We didn't know it at the time, but it was the 24th ship of the PQ-17 convoy to be lost. Its machine guns were mounted on our bridge wings, but the revolvers with which the gunners were armed were taken away by our captain. He did not like having armed men on his ship at all. 
During the rescue operations and the shooting of the transports, the enemy bombers had left us alone, but now they were back. A new series of bombs exploded dangerously close to the sinking El Capitan and the Austin shaking the trawler violently. Our condensers were badly damaged, and the plating was cracking at the seams and could burst at any moment. But at that moment the Germans flew away, leaving us alone under an unusually empty sky. Our senior ASDIC operator had a little quirk. He had previously served on a torpedoed ship and now never slept in his cabin during a cruise. The captain once found him sleeping next to the chimney. He was a good man, however, and the captain had ordered him to build a booth on the upper deck for the duration of the trip. Now that everyone had relaxed a little, he went up to the captain and said, Sir, thank you. You were bloody marvellous. This time the convoy was just about to disappear over the horizon, and we had to increase our speed to catch up. Fortunately, they slowed down to wait for us and the brave Zamalek. The captain of the Pozariki brought his ship closer, and the crew lined up on deck gave a loud hooray to the rescue vessel. The men on the deck of the Zamalek raised an answering shout, a strange enough scene in a cold, deserted sea. Shortly after we joined the convoy, the air alarm sounded once again and a black speck appeared far ahead in the sky. Everyone thought it was a German plane returning to check the results of a prolonged air attack, but as the plane got closer it fired green and red rockets. The guard ships made a return signal. When the plane came close, we saw that it was an ancient flying boat with a pusher propeller. They're their own, Russians. Everyone shouted and waved their arms. Excluding the Valros of the cruising squadron, this was the first owned airplane we had seen since we left Iceland. The flying boat passed over us at low altitude. The pilot responded to our greetings, turned around and flew away. We were confident that now we would not have to wait too long for the cover fighters. However, the Samuel Chase, which was a few miles away from us, was in a very difficult position. After the convoy had passed the Caninos Peninsula, the minesweeper Halcyon noticed that the transport was drifting helplessly. At Skipper Reportic, I have two direct hits and three close bursts. Main steam line has burst. Shall I abandon ship? But the captain of the Halcyon decided to try to save the ship. He said, don't abandon ship. We'll take you in tow. All that followed was an example of splendid seamanship. The trawler had piston engines which enabled it to haul a considerable cargo. The Samuel Chase had a sufficiently strong tow rope started on the Samuel Chase. The Halcyon gradually added revolutions, and the two ships slowly moved forward. They followed the White Sea southward at a speed of five knots. The crew of the minesweeper was ready to give up the tug at any moment if German planes appeared. The American sailors were undoubtedly inspired by the example of the small minesweeper, and in a few hours they managed to repair the vehicle. The transport completed the voyage on its own. In gratitude for the help, the skipper of the Samuel Chase asked the minesweeper to guide him into the harbour, which was done. On the Austin, we were able to pay some attention to our guests from the El Capitan. They were people of many different nationalities. Americans from the northern and southern states, Argentines, Poles, Englishmen. In addition to her own crew, the El Capitan carried those rescued from the John Witherspoon. Some of them had severely frostbitten hands and feet, posing a threat of gangrene. They were all given a double portion of rum followed by a discussion on the problem of food and the accommodation of 89 extra souls. The Chinese proved extremely helpful as they offered to help in the galley. They refused to sleep below, opting for a standing veilboat on deck. The rescue generally behaved quite calmly, although a certain fatalism was evident in their behaviour. 
This, however, was inevitable after the danger had passed. Now they were grumbling quietly, because the ship was designed for fifty officers and sailors, but now there were more than one hundred and forty on board. We had to organize nine makeshift dining tables. The galley was forced to run continuously, but now we were desperately short of knives and forks. The white Americans did not want to eat strange foods. They did not want to be with colored people, which with the lack of space in the mess tents created problems. People slept wherever they could on deck, in cabins, wardrooms, and in corridors all over the ship. Those who could not find a place below were forced to sleep on the upper deck. Some of the rescued unceremoniously occupied the bunks of crewmen on watch and refused to vacate them when the master returned. They were used to relative comfort on merchant ships and could not adapt to the Spartan conditions on the trawler, especially the lack of amenities. The trawler had only two lavatories. Even in the best of times, they were not enough. And now the situation was desperate, so no one was surprised by the row of naked asses sticking out over the bulwark. The only newcomers who were happy with everything were the stokers. They went straight down to their co-workers to help them, as was the long-established tradition. Far behind us came the damaged ocean freedom, accompanied by the Nuffin gem. They were straining hard to catch up with us. Finally, being eight miles astern of the convoy, they spotted our thinning group. The lagging couple made another dash, but when they were three miles from Cape Canning Nose, they were attacked by a group of airplanes. There were only eight or nine of them, but it seemed to Captain Walker and his crew that the entire Luftwaffe had gathered here. The Germans came down on freedom with all the fury they could muster. Time after time, bombs covered the transport, which shuddered and crackled from the close bursts. The Jira compass and all the instruments on the bridge were blown to pieces. The magnetic compass flew out of the neck twos. The plating of both sides was crumpled. Huge columns of water now, and then rose up alongside the ship and crashed down upon it. When the water flowed downward with a noise, it seemed as if the ship had just surfaced from a great depth. But immediately a new waterfall would come crashing down on it. The bridge was flooded. The gunners worked virtually in an underwater position. Every now and then they were washed off the banquettes, but they stubbornly climbed back, wet and stiff. But at the same time the guns did not stop firing. If the planes had not yet achieved a single direct hit, it was the merit of those who stubbornly pressed the throttles. On the gem, too, all the guns were firing, and then the planes suddenly disappeared, and just in time for the freedom was almost out of ammunition by this time. Its decks were littered with shell casings, but by some miracle the ship remained unharmed. Only one man was hurt on the transport. It was an artilleryman who was thrown by the force of the explosion on the hatch cover, and he bruised his spine. Our group, travelling far ahead of the Freedom, finally spotted the shore on the port side. In these last hours of July 10, we were able to enjoy an unheard of sight, sunset and sunrise at the same time. So the morning of July 11 dawned. On this day, we found a new group of escapees in open dinghies and picked them up. Again, many of them were seriously frostbitten. The sea was as smooth as glass and mirages began to flash before us. The ships ahead of us were transformed into strange tall trees, and the smoke from their chimneys was strangely transformed into the branches of these trees. Those on the traverse became like flat islands. The hills on the shore would suddenly break away and rush after us. At first we thought that our minds could not stand the constant tension, and we were seeing hallucinations. But after a while we became accustomed to the strange pictures, although the observers occasionally mistook our own ships for the periscopes of submarines. After stopping briefly at one of the little harbours in the throat of the White Sea, we moved on. 
We were now met by armed Russian trawlers and heavily smoky destroyers covered in fancy camouflage. Farther out in the White Sea, two British trawlers passed us, firing magnetic trawls. It was good to see all these ships. We found that the sea, despite its name, was a dirty brown colour. There were masses of logs floating everywhere. In the afternoon, two Ju-88s jumped out of the clouds and dropped a series of bombs each. Several bombs exploded 100 yards away on the right shell of the Pozariki, but that was the last enemy shot. Then straggling vessels appeared on the horizon and joined us, including the indomitable ocean freedom. We crossed the White Sea without incident. That night the sun became a huge red ball touching the horizon. Therefore the whole sea in front of us was coloured crimson, as if everything was flooded with blood. Then the purple glow faded, and after ten minutes the sun dropped below the horizon. It was the darkness we had missed for the last ten days. N.I.G. The morning of Sunday, July 12, was cloudy and windy. The Lord Austin's bow was ploughing through the water, raising a muddy brown wave. Soon the rain stopped and the clouds parted, and the sun shone brightly as we dropped anchor at the mouth of the Divina River leading to Arkhangelsk. Oh, what a marvellous night we have had with you, came from the loudspeakers of the Pozariki. From the Palomares the number of rescued persons on board all the ships was requested. Only on it there were more than three hundred, and the total number approached a thousand. One thousand men without ships. Yes. It was a fleet defeated head-on. The pilot boat arrived, and we saw the Russians for the first time. A dapper naval officer went aboard the Austin and had a word with our captain, who refused to proceed further until all the frostbitten sailors had been transferred to a ship where they could receive proper medical attention. This was done, and a pilot arrived to join us. We moved up the river, which twisted and turned like a snake. We were all terribly tired, but all the people on deck were looking at the land of the Soviet Union with interest as they were seeing it for the first time. Logs were seen everywhere. They were floating in the water, and on the shore they were piled high. The women working there laughed and waved to us as our ship passed by. The women who looked out of the windows and doors of the wooden huts did the same. Passing boats lowered their flags and the crews waved to us. Although there were very few of us left, the reception was royal. Everywhere we could see sandy beaches, beyond which groves of young trees were green. Still farther away from the river banks were visible beautiful forests of pine trees. Numerous barges much larger than any we had seen before, passed us. They had real wooden houses built on their decks. Some of them even showed mills. Everyone politely saluted us by flying a red flag with a sickle and hammer. Already on the river, Pozarica firmly sat on a sandbar. Sailors, running from board to board, tried to rock the ship, but it did nothing. She had to wait several hours for the tide to come in. It would be a terrible end to a rough passage. We all passed her to our assigned anchorages a few miles off Arkhangelsk. Austin approached a wooden pyre near the village of Maimaksa, where, to our great encouragement, all the rescued sailors were transferred to a large vessel bound for Arkhangelsk. As soon as we docked, children came running out onto the dock, offering to trade their embroidered towels for cigarettes chocolate and soap. They were joined by old women begging for bread. After a few hours we crossed to a huge wooden pier near a village on the banks of the Dvina River, just across from Arkhangelsk. They say the Russians built this pier in only two weeks. Here we met sailors from other ships in the convoy and began to share our impressions. The pieces came together and only now we began to realize the size of the catastrophe that had befallen us. The next day, July 13, about 10.0 all survivors were built on the pier. It was a long job, 
but it was necessary to make lists of the missing. After that, several escort ships prepared to sail back out into the Barents Sea to continue the search. Then we received good news. It turned out that the corvette Dianella arrived in Archangelsk on its own without a scratch. After disbanding the convoy, the corvette went straight to the target. As it entered the White Sea, it encountered three Russian torpedo boats and hastily hoisted a couple of large British flags to show who it was. It transpired that the Dianella was the first ship to arrive at Archangelsk. She was also the first to go out to carry out salvage operations. The good news was that the number of surviving transports had increased to four. In addition, the Ratlin had reappeared. It turned out that it arrived in Archangelsk shortly before us and burned coal literally to the last piece. Its crew had a lot to tell. After the Ratlin fell behind the group of Puzariki, Captain Augustus Banking turned the ship straight north. He followed the ice sheet all the way to Cape Desire, the northern tip of Novaya Zemlya. There he found himself at 78. 45 any just 700 nautical miles from the pole. No British ship had gotten that far in this century. Turning south and travelling along the coast of Novaya Zemlya, it met the American ship Bellingham. Bellingham was very fortunate that it was able to elude the enemy aircraft. The German made several circles over the transport and finally went to attack from the stern. But at that moment there was a band of fog nearby, and Captain Mortensen drove the ship right into it. The confused pilot threw bombs at the iceberg on the starboard side of the Bellingham, blowing it to pieces. But the transport remained intact. As a result, on July 8, as we were reforming the convoy at Coward's Cove, the Ratlin and Bellingham were breaking through broken ice near the throat of the White Sea. The salvage vessel was going at 12 knots, the transports keeping 500 yards astern of her. Suddenly the morning silence was broken by the heavy rumble of aircraft engines. It was an Fu-2200 Condor, a four-engine long-range bomb. It had taken off from the base at Pizzamo. Flying over a layer of morning fog, the Condor entered a gentle dive and dropped three heavy bombs on the ships, all of which were close bursts, and then the pilot decided to repeat the approach, this time at the height of the masts. Everyone understood that if the plane gets a hit, the sailors will be left to trust only in God and on board the Ratlin were 240 people, many of whom have not yet recovered from the shock after the loss of their own ship and sailing in the sea covered with icebergs. They refused to go below and stayed on deck around the chimney where it was a little warmer. The ship would not have enough lifeboats and rafts for even half that number. As the Condor sped past, its tail gunner opened fire with automatic cannon on the Bellingham, turning the tube and superstructures into a sieve. The Ruthlin had a brand new Beaufort's on her stern, which responded with several bursts. To their great surprise, the gunners hit the plane. Condor turned steeply to the left. In its forward cockpit showed a dim red glow, and in a few seconds a bright orange flame engulfed the entire fuselage. The airplane took a sharp nosedive and crashed into the sea only a quarter of a mile from the ships. The wreckage continued to blaze, even floating in the water. Aitlin launched a speedboat, but as he approached the airplane, it slowly sank. All that remained were scattered papers and smoldering wreckage. Of the plane's seven crew members, sailors found only two of them. However, they were dead, their bodies bobbing on the water face down. The boat quickly turned back and the Ratlin moved on its previous course. Condor must have sent a radio message before launching the attack, so new planes could appear at any moment. The two ships safely entered the White Sea where they were met by an ancient Russian destroyer. They arrived at the mouth of the Northern Diviner two days before us. 
There they met a third ship waiting for a pilot, the Russian tanker Donbass. It too managed to break through despite a torpedo hit. The tanker received a huge hole in the bow. The water noisily rushed inside the hull and flowed back out in a joyful cascade. It was saved through the efforts of the gunners of the Daniel Morgan. The High Commissioner personally thanked them for what they had done. Ekite. Lord Howe Howe, in another radio address, choked with joy. Mr. Churchill, you have not told the British people the whole truth about the last convoy to Russia. I will tell the people the truth. The entire convoy was sent to the bottom. Not one of the merchant ships reached Russia. The German High Command issued a communique which was more restrained, but very slight. It was announced that one American cruiser and 28 merchant ships had been sunk. Another ten ships were damaged and many American sailors were rescued and taken prisoner. What kind of cruiser the Germans sank, we never learned. But the picture presented to our eyes in Arkhangelsk was more than gloomy. The mood of the rescued Americans deteriorated even more. Twelve out of thirteen escort ships arrived safely to the port. Only the trawler Arashire was missing. But only four out of thirty-three transports arrived. Ocean Freedom, Samuel Chase, Bellingham and Donbass. Two salvage ships have also arrived. But where are the others? Soon came the news that several ships had safely reached Novaya Zemlya. On July 16, four days after arriving in Arkhangelsk, Commodore Dowdin again went to sea on the corvette Poppy. Together with him went Lotus and Amalouine. They were to rescue the remnants of the defeated convoy. Meanwhile, the Lord Austin began taking on coal in preparation to begin patrolling.